other than to say that it is taking place and we'll look very closely at the evidence in that consultation to see how we take things forward. Thank you. That ends topical questions. The next item of business is a debate on motion number 11877 in the name of Margaret Burgess on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. Members who wish to take part in the debate should press the request to speak button now and I'll give a few moments for the front benches to get themselves settled. I now call Margaret Burgess to speak to move the motion. Minister, 14 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open this Stage 1 debate on the principles of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. And I would like to extend my gratitude to Michael McMahon and the members of the Welfare Reform Committee for both their scrutiny of the bill and their Stage 1 report on it. Thanks are also due to the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their consideration of the Bill and their contribution to the Lead Committee's scrutiny of the Bill. The Welfare Reform Committee should also be commended for taking evidence from such a wide range of organisations and individuals. The evidence from users of the Fund was especially compelling, and I am grateful to those stakeholders for the considered views they offered the Committee and also for the responses to the numerous Scottish Government consultations which helped to shape both the policy objectives of the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund and the proposals within the Bill. The Committee's conclusion that the Bill provides a suitable framework for establishing the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund on a secure statutory footing is to be welcomed. And that conclusion capt captures well what the Government wants to achieve through this Bill, that is, to put in place a permanent, reliable safety net for people on low incomes, a safety net in which they can have confidence. The committee made a number of suggestions and detailed recommendations and comments and called on the government to consider and respond to these during the later stages of the bill's parliamentary scrutiny. The government is reflecting on some of these at present and I will set out our position on all of them in our response to the report prior to Stage 2 proceedings. In this afternoon's debate, the focus should be on the principles of the Bill and what we want to achieve through it, though I will try and address some of the more significant points that the Committee raised. As to the general principles of the Bill, it has to be said that this is a slightly unusual Bill in that it seeks to put an existing scheme onto a statutory footing. Members will be aware that the Scottish Welfare Fund has been operating on a voluntary interim basis since April 2013, following agreement between Scottish Ministers and COSLA leaders. It has been clear to me from the evidence the Committee heard and from its report that delivery of the current scheme is generally viewed in a positive fashion, albeit that there is scope to improve practice. In fact, most people have told us and the committee that local authorities are the right people to be, to be delivering the fund and that the experience of applicants is generally more positive than experienced under the previous Department for Work and Pensions scheme. Indeed, Scott Robertson from Quarriers observed at the evidence session on the 7th of October, the comparison between the new system and the previous system is like night and day. It's also worth noting that there is no longer an equivalent local welfare scheme in operation across England. So this is a clear example of this government taking a distinctive approach to protect vulnerable people in Scotland. Feedback on the patchwork of provision in England gives me confidence that the Scottish Government is doing the right thing with this bill. However, this doesn't mean we're complacent. We have done a lot of work to ensure lessons are learnt and good practice shared since the fund was launched. And this work will continue as we move towards the permanent arrangements. We've been working extensively with local authority practitioners and third sector stakeholders to ensure that learning from the interim scheme is captured and good practice is shared. Only last month, a series of decision-making workshops were held with local authority practitioners across the country to help them hone their decision-making skills. These workshops included case studies from third sector partners, such as Who Cares Scotland and Engender. 
The case studies help to enhance the quality improvement measures we are undertaking with COSLA to make the Scottish Welfare Fund as effective as possible. Given the high level nature of the bill, it has not been particularly affected by this work, but it will be of great value when we develop the associated regulations and detailed guidance, which will really set out how welfare funds will operate under the permanent arrangements. At this point, it would be appropriate to reflect on the, rational, the rationale for this bill. The reasoning behind its introduction was threefold. First, it demonstrates a long-term commitment to the Scottish Welfare Fund. And as I said earlier, the current scheme is administered voluntarily under an agreement between Scottish ministers and COSLA leaders. Second, it provides the option of independent review of cases by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, which would not be possible without this bill. And finally, it allows for the funding for the welfare funds to be ring-fenced if required. The bill is designed to set a high-level framework which reflects the wording of the Section 30 order, which gave the powers to the Scottish Parliament to deliver the type of assistance provided by the current Scottish Welfare Fund. The regulations and associated statutory guidance which will set out the detail of how the funds should operate. Informed by the evidence of the committee has heard in the bill, we will be consulting on draft regulations and guidance before the pe permanent arrangements come into force. We consulted on a draft bill between November last year and February this year, and the most significant change to the draft bill that we consulted on was to propose that the SPSO have powers to carry out independent reviews of local authority decisions. Responses to the consultation were divided on the best option for review, but I am convinced that the SPSO best meets the criteria for second tier reviews we set out in our consultation. And most importantly, the independence of the SPSO will ensure that the right decisions are being made for applicants. And this will give them and the people who work with them greater confidence in the Scottish Welfare Funds. The SPSO's national overview will also play an important role in continuing to improve the quality of decision making and helping to maintain the national character of the scheme. And I know there's significant interest in how SPSO will discharge its responsibilities in respect of the independent review function proposed in the bill. Indeed, this is something that the Ombudsman raised in his written evidence to the committee. We've been in discussion with the Ombudsman regarding how best to enable him to have the powers that he regards as necessary to discharge the proposed review function as effectively as possible. And we intend to bring forward stage two amendments that will give SPSO powers in relation to reviews that match his existing powers for complaints in areas such as evidence gathering confidentiality and reporting. I know that stakeholders have very different views on the powers to outsource administ administration of welfare funds under Section 3 of the Bill. And this was included in the Bill because it is a new service and we wanted to provide flexibility for the varying approaches to delivery among local authorities. But others, have, however, have expressed concerns that the provision would introduce the possibility of outsourcing to private sector firms and highlighted issues around delivery of welfare-related services by the private sector. And I've given a lot of consideration to this, to the unique position of the Scottish Welfare Fund in providing a safety net to a local authority's most vulnerable people. The value added by the local knowledge and signposting and referral to other services as part of a social work Scottish Welfare Fund application. And I have also considered the different positions that stakeholders hold in this debate, including the position taken in the Committee's Stage 1 report. And while I can see a case for local authorities collaborating to provide services across boundaries, I have concluded that effective provision of the Scottish Welfare Fund is not consistent with outsourcing of the service and I therefore intend to bring forward an amendment at stage two to remove the ability of local authorities to outsource provision, to outsource provision of the welfare funds from the bill. Um, 
and I, I clearly from the response in the chamber that that's welcome and I, I welcome that welcome uh, for it because it's, it's something it was never the intention that this could be outsourced to the private sector and I think in listening to the evidence that was put to the committee while it was never the intention or ever suggested clearly there was a perception that that could happen and was going to happen and I think it's right at this stage to be very clear that's going to be removed uh, from the bill and, and we'll bring forward amendments to that effect at stage, stage two. Presiding officer, as the committee recognised, this bill is about putting the interim Scottish Welfare Fund on a more secure statutory footing. It will enable us to demonstrate a long-term commitment to the Scottish Welfare Fund and to provide for independent review of welfare fund applications and it will give us the flexibility to ring fence the funding provided. And I want to work with all members across the chamber and all parties to secure these objectives because this is about helping the most vulnerable people uh, in our communities, the length and breadth of Scotland. And I think um, in having the, the welfare fund, uh, the interim fund that we had, on a, a voluntary basis. We have learned a lot of lessons from that and ways to take things forward. And, and I think that's what we, we hope to do with this bill, but it will be the detail of the regulations that will set it out uh, of how we proceed. So I want to move the motion that Parliament agrees the general principles of the Welfare Funds Scotland Bill. Okay. Thank you, Minister. Uh, before I invite Michael McMahon to speak on behalf of the Welfare Reform Committee, can I just point out to members that there is um, a bit of time in hand today, so um, we will be extremely generous um, with your contributions. So can I now call on Michael McMahon, the convener of the Welfare Reform Committee. Michael McMahon, you have 10 minutes or thereby. Thank you very much, President Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Welfare Reform Committee following our Stage 1 report on the Welfare Funds Scotland Bill. And in opening, I would like to thank the clerks of the committee and colleagues uh, who served on the committee throughout the consideration of the, the Bill at Stage 1 for the hard work that they put in to listening to those who I also thank uh, for giving uh, evidence to the committee and informing us of the issues and concerns uh, of uh, Civic Scotland and others to uh, issues around the delivery of this um, new fund. Uh, today we are here to debate a bill which places that interim Scottish Welfare Fund on a statutory basis. The interim fund has already been a benefit to many vulnerable people across Scotland and we know that from the evidence that we took and I would like to reiterate the example given by the, the Minister uh, from the DWP, the comparison uh, to the DWP, uh, DWP fund, which was given by Scott Robertson from Couriers, who observed that the comparison between the new system and the previous system is like night and day. Local authorities have also reported the benefits. Creating a statutory duty will provide greater assurance and the ability to retain staff members, expertise and knowledge. It will also help to secure local authority funding and resources in the future and encourage better engagement with local partners. Section 2 of the draft bill sets out the circumstances in which a local authority can provide assistance. In particular, we heard about the need of families facing extreme financial pressure, not as a result of sudden crisis, but as an ongoing part of their everyday life. When the scheme operated as the DWP social fund, it had a category for families under exceptional pressure. This is a group of people which the current guidance clearly intends to fund the, the fund to support. However, it is not present on the face of the Scottish Bill. And that's why we have argued the Scottish Government should reconsider the eligibility criteria in light of the evidence received to ensure that all those in legitimate need of the fund are able to access it. Section 3 of the Bill allows for outsourcing or joint administration of the fund between local authorities. And in the evidence we took, there are benefits that may be drawn from joint working, particularly from smaller authorities such as economies of scale, increased purchasing power, sharing best practice and increased consistency. But third sector organisations are very firmly against the use of private third party providers being involved in the delivery of state benefits for profit. 
Now, as a committee, we have heard horror stories of the ATOS administration of the work capability assessments, and we are clear that we do not want a repeat of that situation. So the committee took some comfort that the Scottish Government did not, did not envisage at that point uh, the fund being outsourced to a private company. However, we did note that contra contracting out these services would likely be subject to EU regulations on public procurement, which requires public bodies to comply with rules around equal treatment and non-discrimination. In light of this, some members felt that outsourcing should be removed from the bill and that that provision should be restricted to joint working with other local authorities. However, the majority of the committee was content to recommend that the Scottish Government consider the issue of outsourcing in light of EU procurement laws and thresholds to ensure that private companies are not allowed to undertake that work. This was probably the most contentious area of the bill, and I'm delighted from my own perspective that the Minister, having heard the evidence, uh, has made the statement which she did uh, in her opening uh, comments around this issue. I'm not sure if Alec Johnson uh, will continue with his position in relation to that, but I'm delighted that the, cabinet, this, that the minister sorry, has, has moved uh, to the, the position that she has. Section 4 of the bill concerns the review of decisions and the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman taking on a new role as a second-tier review body. Witnesses' views on this new role were split. Local authorities commented that it would be more consistent with the principles of local self-governance for secondary reviews to remain in local authority control. The third sector was in favour of the use of the SPSO as it was seen as independent, consistent and impartial. Now, we agree that these principles are essential in any review body. As such, we supported the Scottish Government's proposal for the SPSO to conduct second-tier reviews and welcome the SPSO's commitment to carry out a full consultation and to publish guidance. We also support the call for an appropriate provision to this effect to be included in the legislation. Section 5 of the Bill sets out the circumstances in which payments or assistance may be repaid or recovered. We understand and support the Scottish Government's clear intention that the fund is a grant-making scheme. However, in the interest of future proofing, the fund, we recommend a clarification to ensure that recovery of awards only applies when dealing with fraud. In terms of funding the increasing level of demand on the fund and the increasing impact of welfare reforms, many of which are still to be seen, were concerns, these were concerns for witnesses. We also heard from third sector organisations as they highlighted concerns about the variation in spend across Scotland. And the minister, minister responded to those concerns with an assurance that the Scottish Government would uh, consider a needs-based approach to future budget allocations, and the, wel the committee welcomes this proposal. We also recommend an additional category to monitor any unmet need, and the reason why that need has arisen is included in COSLA's benchmarking indicators. A strong message also came from the that came from the evidence was that administrative funding is falling short and that local authorities are supplementing this from their own budgets. We heard from Dundee that they are short 30 or 40 per cent just on the cost of processing applications. COSLA said failure to address these concerns could potentially jeopardise the wider outcomes that the bill is trying to achieve. It is vital that administration of the fund is supported and that growth in demand is recognised. And we welcome the assurances that the Scottish Government will reconsider the distribution of administrative funding pending any strong evidence which arises through an upcoming benchmarking exercise due to be completed by COSLA. And we encourage COSLA to make its findings publicly available as soon as possible. This issue of funding allocated to the setup of the SPSO in the role of second tier reviewer provoked a mixed response. There was a focus in our discussions about the uncertainty around the number of cases that the SPSO will need to deal with. Jim Martin, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, said, for planning purposes, we have had to arrive at a number in order to think through what the implications would be if we reach a certain level of appeals. What the actual numbers will turn out to be is anyone's guess at the moment. So this uncertainty will have a significant yet currently unquantifiable impact on the funding 
resource and space requirements for the SPSO. So we welcome the SPSO's intention to be flexible in order to adapt to changing demands, and once legislation is in place, reviews should be conducted to allow the true nature of demand for second-tier reviews to be established. As the Bill only provides a framework, much of the detail about the running of the Fund will appear in regulations and guidance. And as such, we recommend that the regulations should be subject to the affirmative <coughs> procedure. Witnesses also put forward a wide range of evidence on the operation of the Fund to date. I will highlight one or two of these points. Strong arguments were made about whether it was better for an applicant to receive an award in the form of cash, or whether it was better to receive vouchers or goods. The provision of goods allows councils to know that the award is being used as intended, and opportunities can be provided for local businesses in procurement and distribution. However, being allowed a choice is essential to maintain a level of dignity, self-determination and reduce stigma. Treating applicants with respect, despite their circumstances, is vital. So we welcome the Scottish Government's assurance that it will be looking again at the issue of stigmatisation and choice. Providing options and meeting individual needs should be central to the Fund's process. We spoke to some, uh, directly to some of those individuals, and Connor, a welfare fund user, said, I felt quite a lot of the time as though the person did not recognise me as a person. They just saw me as a voice on the phone looking for money. If they were to meet face to face with people, they could see the reality that you're a human being who has nowhere else to turn. Fund users have also had a view on processing times. In the interim Scottish Welfare Fund scheme, local authorities have 48 hours in which to process a crisis grant. However, in the previous DWP fund, that deadline was 24 hours. And we view crisis grants as an essential part of the safety net provided to vulnerable people. So it's essential that local authorities work as quickly as possible to deliver grants to applicants and keep them informed of the process. The committee notes the Minister's assurance that local authorities are working to that same-day deadline and that the 48 hours is the maximum time allowed. In conclusion, overall, we welcome the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill and support its general principles. The committee re recommends that the Bill passes Stage 1. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Jackie Bailey, an extraordinarily generous 10 minutes as we have a bit of time in hand this afternoon. Ms. Bailey. Oh my goodness, it's not an offer I'm often made um, by the presiding officer, so I shall take him at his word. Um, can I start, presiding officer, by saying what pleasure it gives me to speak on the debate on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill on behalf of the Scottish Labour Party. As members may know, it will be full to Ken McIntosh to close, but actually to carry forward this portfolio in the future. So I thank um, the Minister for Housing and for Welfare, um, and I hope she's enjoyed our tussles in the chamber over the piece. Perhaps not, um, but I'm sure she'll be glad to see the back of me. Um, can I thank Michael McMahon as convener of the Welfare Reform Committee for his consideration of the bill, together with his colleague MSPs, um, the clerks to the committee, and everybody that gave evidence. Can I also, because I think they play a vital role in all of this, thank the staff in local authorities across the country who process and make decisions on the claims, um, it has been a learning process for them. Not everything that we've all done has ever been right, um, but I think we are now starting to get there. But in the spirit of goodwill and the newfound consensus, it is Christmas after all. Let me indicate that Labour will be supporting the general principles of the bill. I well remember when the Scottish Welfare Fund was first created following the devolution of crisis grants and community care grants from the UK Parliament to the Scottish Parliament. I look forward to more of that in the future when the Smith Agreement is implemented, but that, of course, is a debate for Thursday afternoon. Suffice to say that the Smith Agreement represents the biggest transfer of powers to this Scottish Parliament ever. It is a promise delivered, and I'm excited at the potential that this presents, the potential to shape some benefits differently, the potential to top up existing benefits, and perhaps the most imaginative of all, the potential to create new benefits in devolved areas. So this will not be, in a second, this will not be the last piece of legislation we see on welfare. In fact, the contrary. There is much, much more to come. Happy to give way.
I thank Jackie Bailey for, for, for giving way. Uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted that you're excited by some of the new powers over benefits that will be coming to Scotland. Would you agree with me that any benefits paid by Scotland, uh, should, there should be no cash clawback, say, from means-tested benefits across the UK, such as income support, and that any benefits paid in Scotland or topped up in Scotland should not be uh, taken back from a UK Treasury at any point? Jackie Bailey? Um, I don't think there has even been a debate on that. I think the power to top up is exactly that. I wouldn't anticipate that there would be clawback. I genuinely think top up is to increase. Um, and therefore, I think the member is probably getting excited before something um, is, is happening. But, you know, I do recognise that the Scottish Welfare Fund was established without statutory underpinning. I agree that was the right approach to test the operation of the fund before legislation, because there has been much to learn. There are concerns, though, in a number of areas, and guidance, as we know, has been changed a number of times to reflect those concerns, including um, the issue of being able to provide um, to people who have been sanctioned. But the operation of the fund was devolved to local authorities, and it would be fair to say that it has been with a degree of mixed results. Local authorities, naturally, there are 32 of them, they did things in different ways. In some instances, not always to the benefit of those in need, but I'm sure that was completely unintentional. But decision-making was inconsistent. Some were tougher than others on awarding grants. Others, again, had trouble spending their budget. Some local authorities covering our most disadvantaged areas have done, could have done with more money because the need in their area was greater than they could meet. And whilst we're on the budget, let me just record how disappointed I was that the fund was underspent at the end of the year. Time after time, we came to this chamber asking about the underspends from the very first quarter to the very last quarter, um, and we were assured that the money would be sent, spent. And you know, it's not as if there isn't a need out there. We are experiencing our worst cost of living crisis in generations. The level of sanctions is rising at a staggering rate. So to underspend that fund borders for me on the criminal. The total underspend at year end was £4 million. That's 12% of the overall budget. Money that could have helped stave off hardship for families in the last year. No, I've already given way. I need to make some progress, but I'm happy to take you later on. Um, there is a question of whether it is also appropriate to provide goods rather than treating people with the respect and dignity I think we all believe they deserve and allowing them some choice, but I will come on to that later. Let me, in turn, presiding officer, deal with a number of issues. Eligibility, first, um, was raised by both the committee report and in a number of briefings from third sector organisations. And I welcome the committee's recommendation to widen eligibility. We need to ensure that no vulnerable person is excluded from seeking support. We need to make information about the fund widely available. Now, the bill's language implies that the majority of the fund's clients are already somehow in the system. But this excludes vulnerable groups that, of people who may well not be on benefits themselves. Many of the most vulnerable people may not be seen to fit the criteria as currently laid out. And I hope that the Minister agrees that more work is needed. Let me look at the language in the bill because my fear is it might be restrictive. Third sector particularly note that the definition of qualifying individuals excludes care leavers, families under exceptional pressure or people with disabilities. Language about exceptional circumstances may also discourage applicants and for example people whose benefits run out before bills um, who need to be paid people who face intermittent costs like replace, replacing a broken cooker or people facing benefit delays or sanctions. So let me be clear, I believe the language should be widened to include families experiencing exceptional pressure as recommended by CPAG and the Poverty Alliance. We know they're facing a cost of living crisis, the likes of which we haven't seen for generations. We already know that families under exceptional pressure are underrepresented in the Scottish Welfare, One, Welfare Fund awards, 20% of community care grants for 2013-14 versus 53.6% from the UK Social Fund in 12-13. So there is clearly more to be done there. Let me turn briefly to the issue of outsourcing. And I strongly disagree with the idea that the Scottish Welfare Fund could be outsourced to the private sector. I think we've all been very strong in our condemnation of what we've seen Atus do 
even just with assessments, so much so that they themselves have withdrawn from part of the delivery of UK assessments. I genuinely believe that decisions on benefits must be done by government. So I am delighted, absolutely delighted, that the Minister has had a change of mind um, and I take great comfort from her view that she doesn't want this to be contained in the bill and I look forward on um, that coming forward at stage two. Can I congratulate her though on listening to the members of the committee, certainly not her own members who differed on this issue, but other members in the committee who argued this particularly strongly. I do think the bill should allow for joint work with other local authorities. Um, and I genuinely do think outsourcing to the third sector would have produced a conflict of interest. Many of these groups are actually helping people apply for grants. Um, it would be difficult for them to advocate for clients and yet be the one to make benefit decisions. So that is all removed and I am grateful for that. Let me turn to the appeals process. It is essential, I think, um, for the Scottish Welfare Fund users that the review process is transparent, it's impartial and it's independent, especially since the first tier reviews are carried out by local authorities, having that independent agency carrying out second tier reviews is crucial. Now I did raise, almost a year ago, probably more, the question of social security commissioners with Nicola Sturgeon when she held the cabinet post. She denied that such an appeal mechanism was necessary. So I am delighted again that the government is listening and changing their mind on this. Let me ask about the low number of appeals so far because I think we need to understand why appeals have been so low. Is it that people are content with the decisions? Are they not being informed that they have the right to appeal? Or is their crisis so bad that they actually can't hang around and wait for an outcome? Um, I'm asking these questions because there is a significant overturn rate when there is an appeal. In 2013-14, there were 2,700 reviews for both community care grants and crisis grants. And in both cases, more than 50% of the decisions were ch then changed. Now, I welcome that because we learn from it. But I think we need to understand exactly what's going on so that we truly learn the lessons um, from that process. But we need to ensure that there's a statement in every decision letter informing people of their right to appeal. Local authorities must make applicants aware of their rights, whether they're given an award or not, um, and that whatever agency carries out the second tier reviews, those decisions are binding. I'm happy, if my understanding is correct, that the SPSO can overturn decisions rather than simply looking at the decision-making process. That is a change to how they operate, but I think that is a welcome change indeed. We do need to look at timescales um, so that we have timely decisions. At the moment, the bill, maybe for understandable reasons, is vague on the review process, and maybe that's for secondary guidance. Um, but I do think we must have set out somewhere in statute our expectation in terms of timelines and reporting requirements, because we need a nationwide consistent approach. This matters, and it matters to reviews and appeals as well. It was interesting that in the evidence to the committee, the SPSO was also perceived as being the most fair and impartial body um, to take this forward in a way that local authorities um, just didn't cut the mustard. Let me quote Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland. Nobody, not one single disabled person whom we asked, said that the local authorities should do it. People said that that would not be perceived as fair. Even if the decision was correct, the local authority would still be reviewing its own decision and that was just felt to be unfair. Presiding officer, um, in closing, let me turn to an issue of stigma, because it was a key issue experienced by people on low incomes is the stigma that comes with living in poverty. The most vulnerable of us should not be made to feel small simply because we are poor. Like you and I expect to be treated with dignity and respect, the most vulnerable among us should also be treated in the same way. So I very much welcome the committee's recommendation that trust and respect for applicants be one of the underlying principles of the fund. With these principles, though, of trust and respect, to my mind comes choice. Vulnerable people should be given a choice in the decision-making process that concerns their own lives. It should be a choice between receiving goods or receiving a cash payment instead, if an individual's situation calls for it. Simply giving out goods 
reverses decades of agreed policy and practice in relation to benefits. And I'm sure the minister would not want to do that. Having that choice, presiding officer, helps to reduce the stigma of poverty and it enables people to live a dignified life. Finally, presiding officer, can I close again by welcoming the general principles of the bill and look forward to the minister continuing to listen so that improvements are made again at stage two. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Alex Johnston. A very generous six minutes to you too, Mr Johnston. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd uh, like to take the early opportunity uh, in this debate to thank my former colleagues on the Welfare Reform Committee uh, because I left that committee some two, bits, uh, two weeks ago uh, and have gone on to other activities. However, my three years on that committee have been a very enjoyable time, I must say. Uh, I thank my colleagues and uh, members of the clerking team for the way in which they've taken my very different attitudes at some times. Uh, contradictory would be fair, a fair description, uh, but they've taken them in good spirit uh, and realised that I was doing a particular job and that I may not agree with my colleagues on everything. As a result, uh, I think I was taken uh, as the kind of pantomime villain uh, of the piece on a number of occasions uh, and will, will attempt to... <laughs> I, was wait I was waiting for somebody to shout, look out behind you, and I'd ask them what exactly was Willie Rennie doing. <laughs> However, the... The process we've gone through in relation to this piece of legislation has been a very informative one because not only did we look at this legislation in the normal process, we also had the responsibility of looking at the interim scheme as it was introduced. So along with the government, we've had the opportunity to look at some of the difficulties that were experienced uh, and actually work our way through them as the government had to work through these problems. In fact, the in interim arrangements, I think, were a steep learning curve for both the government and for the local authorities who had to administer them. The first this was, of course, the, the first step into the welfare arena, uh, one which has been mentioned by other speakers is uh, going to be repeated uh, as time goes on and more issues are devolved. But it was ironic that this particular uh, attempt to uh, implement welfare uh, in one aspect of Scot Scotland's responsibility did leave us uh, in the unusual position of having a Scottish government who uh, took on this responsibility and perhaps underestimated the responsibility that it had taken on. The result was that on more than one occasion we heard of people who felt in the early days of the scheme back in 2013 uh, felt they had applied uh, and should have been entitled to receive support and were not. The, there was a mistaken belief uh, around that the social fund had simply been abolished rather than being devolved. And as a result, many people didn't realise that the new scheme still existed. And we've spoken to a number of people during the committee inquiry uh, who had to be informed by some route or other and were surprised to discover that the money was still available. As a result of these early difficulties, there's firm evidence that applicants in key local authority areas may have been turned away from the scheme when they should have received help. And some applicants uh, in the earlier part of that first year uh, may have been refused when, if they'd applied in the latter part of the, that year, they may have been accepted. I have spoken to people who were refused help in these early days and were referred on to food banks so ironically then, the Scottish Government may actually blame welfare reform for some of the shortcomings in social policy, while they themselves, or at least a scheme which they administer, may have been one of the key drivers uh, for that transfer. So consequently, we have learned a lot. The nature of the legislation that is being introduced it is one which I am broadly supportive of, and the Conservatives will vote in favour of this bill at stage one tonight. However, as has been mentioned, there is one area in the report where I felt it necessary uh, to register my objection, and that was in relation to the discussion around outsourcing. Now, I understand that there are many people in this Parliament, a majority, I'm sure, for whom the private sector 
is simply not an appropriate route for providing public service. I would dispute that on a fundamental level, but that's not where I wish to go at this particular moment. What concerns me about the failure to allow uh, the private sector to become involved is that we are taking this decision away from local authorities. Now, if we as politicians in this chamber have faith in local authorities, then we should have had faith that they would not choose to take this action. And I think one of the things we're doing today as a result of the change that the government have introduced uh, or have promised to introduce is we are undermining the decision-making process of local authorities. Perhaps local authorities would not have used this power, but denying them the option to use that power is, I believe, an example of centralising power and undermining local authorities. But on this same issue, on another, uh, in another, from another angle, there is also the concern I have that by taking away the opportunity for private sector uh, to, to wield this power, we may be taking away the opportunity for third sector organisations to enter into partnerships using a private sector model as a vehicle when we could, in fact, have allowed some very, uh, people of very high expertise to become involved. OK, the decision has been made by government that this avenue will be closed off. I believe that will be shown in future to have been a mistake. I think the experience of the previous scheme, particularly the involvement of local authorities, teaches us a lesson that local authorities have the potential to be the vehicle for the introduction of a great deal of the new welfare powers which are coming down the road thanks to the Smith Commission. I think we have seen uh, a steep learning curve, as I said earlier, but we've seen local authorities start in a very difficult set of circumstances and at the end of that process uh, reasonably successfully uh, finding their way through it. Taking evidence on the bill, uh, we spoke to a number of people in local authorities who have demonstrated that they now have a great deal of expertise and a great deal to offer in this area. Uh, and I would commend those who came forward and gave evidence and were honest with us, were open with us, and sometimes told the committee things it didn't want to hear. But it demonstrated the great level of experience which now exists. On key aspects of the bill, there are a number of things that I have to express my support for or concern about. Yes, the second tier reviews being conducted with SPSO is a, an excellent idea. I think it's an appropriate way to go. But as has previously been expressed by other speakers in this debate, the issue of cost and the likely numbers that will go through that process remains a, a variable which we cannot predict at this stage. And as a consequence, uh, I have some concerns about how that may turn out. An issue which was raised on some occasions uh, was the issue of administration costs within the schemes. And uh, particularly uh, local authority representatives who uh, objected to the fact that not enough with it money within the scheme had been allocated to admin costs is a concern. We know that admin costs will be high, but I'm worried that they may get out of hand in this scheme and consequently we have to be sure that we are receiving the necessary levels of efficiency and ensuring that as much money as possible is being passed to those who need it, who qualify for it and who need it to carry on their lives and not simply being worn away in administration. The idea of widening the, the qualification criteria is one that I understand, but we must look at that in terms of the additional cost and how it will be financed. As we move forward, this Parliament must be accountable for its actions. It must be accountable for how it raises money as well as how it spends it. So it must be taken forward with both these concerns at the front of our mind. On the issue of cash and kind, or kind, I believe that we took a great deal of evidence during the inquiry that indicated people are very happy to receive assistance and support in kind. I think we spoke to witnesses who were very pleased to have had uh, white goods or carpets delivered and fitted when simply being given the money, especially in an area where it was difficult to acquire these things at reasonable cost. 
would have been a sec the second preference. You can draw to a close now, please. Uh, indeed, I will. On the issue of face-to-face -face, uh, rather than phone uh, service for the application process, we did hear people say that they like face-to-face -face meetings, but the speed of the phone process is also important to many people, and we should not ignore that. Finally, the issue of the 24 or the 48-hour timescale. Uh, I believe that there is some discussion, some confusion perhaps, over what these two timings actually mean. But I believe I heard people give evidence to the committee that suggested that their applications had per perhaps been in the entry for an extra 24 hours simply to reach that 48 hour limit. We need to emphasize that if 48 hours is the limit, then if it can be done in 24, it should be done in 24, and there should be no backup or stockpiling of applications. So, right, you must with that said, now, please, I, I can give my commitment that we will support this bill at stage one tonight. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Uh, we have some time left in hand now. I call on Claire Adamson to be followed by Alex Rowley. Generous six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I um, welcome the debate this afternoon on this um, Stage 1 report from the committee and welcome the, cabinet's, uh, the Minister's comments regarding the, the report and the bill that um, will put um, the, the report mentions that this will be a suitable framework in which um, the bill can move forward. It will give a secure statutory footing to the Welfare Fund and it also demonstrates the permanency and the commitment to a safety net and security in Scotland in this area. I very recently um, joined the Welfare Committee and I find myself relatively new to this report and to the Welfare Funds Bill. Um, and I would like too to thank the convener Michael McMahon and the previous members of the committee for their um, diligence during stage one deliberations and producing what is a comprehensive and welcome stage one report and I'm enthused about taking this bill through the committee stages in the coming months. I was a bit surprised to hear that um, uh, one of the members had enjoyed his time in the committee. I have to say from having read the evidence and seeing some of the reports, um, I think um, enjoyment would be a, a difficult way to describe it. I'm sure it has been indeed harrowing and difficult for the members of the committee on occasion and I pay tribute to those who have given evidence and come forward um, to, uh, to discuss what is, is very, very difficult situations that they find themselves in. I have mixed feelings about the bill. To me, it is regrettable that Scottish resources and efforts are to be spent in mitigating bad and indeed, in my opinion, appalling and inhumane decisions taken in another place. I regret that Scotland did not um, take on these powers um, here in this place and as an independent Scotland and that the welfare settlement proposed by the Smith Commission does not bring significant powers to, to shape welfare in Scotland. And I sit with both the STUC and some of the, the other um, third sector organisations have said that this is indeed a missed opportunity. But the Welfare Reform Committee have done an excellent job. We should, uh, as the Minister said, the Welfare Fund has already helped over 100,000 households. And this bill will put the fund on a statutory basis to ensure that that vital help continues. I was um, thankful to some of the third sector organisations who provided briefings this afternoon and um, I was very struck in reading the, the CAB um, briefing um, when they actually describe what destitution means in Scotland and says this welfare fund is about people in crisis. I would like to put that on record this afternoon. They say destitution, while an emotive word, is a useful term to use to describe a situation in which a client cannot afford to obtain essentials for life through their own means. This goes beyond poverty. Where a person is unable to cut back any more and needs some sort of external assistance, Bureau statistics do not record these situations specifically, although a number of indicators such as issues recording the number of food parcel recommendations show that this is increasing. And the Assistance Advice Scotland go on to extrapolate the figures they have for this year to show that um, while they had one in 50 last year seeking advice, having a recommendation of a food parcel, they expect that by the end of the year that will be as much as one in 42 clients seeking advice. Um, and this is simply a level of poverty and 
as they say destitution in Scotland that is simply unacceptable. So while I'm really glad that the Welfare Fund has been established and has been working since 2014, working and helping 32,000 families in Scotland, I'm more, more than happy that this report at stage one, which seems to be accepted across the chamber, will take that bill forward to ensure that this is indeed a permanent commitment to welfare in Scotland. I think that the... Um, this is really important um, to commend the Scottish Government and what they have done so far. I think that the fact that they have topped up the money that was provided by the UK by £9 million is an indicator of how seriously the Scottish Government take this situation. And I know that this hasn't happened elsewhere, where the, the full amount of the fund has not been given down into welfare funds across other areas in the country. In the stage one report, the Welfare Reform Committee recognised, and quote, the, the greater stability that a statutory duty for local authorities to maintain a welfare fund brings in securing staff and resources, as well as an improved, most, more holistic service. And I think this is really important. And um, I think the Quarrier's quote that's been used twice this afternoon about this being um, day compared to night of the previous operation of the system is indeed very, very welcome news in Scotland. I'm glad that the Scottish Government is providing over £100 million in 2015-16 to mitigate for families in Scotland from the impact of Westminster welfare cuts, although it is regrettable that that mitigation is necessary. It's unacceptable that anyone should be living in poverty in a country as wealthy as Scotland. We are taking action in setting aside £104 million in the next year's budget to tackle poverty and inequalities and help those affected by the welfare changes. And this is very welcome indeed. I mentioned the system of the Vice Bureau earlier in, in my speech and um, I note that they are taking forward the issue of welfare reform and have announced that they have established a new Scottish Leaders in Welfare and Benefits group and um, Lord McFall, who chairs that group, has said the overall the aim of this group is to work collaboratively to highlight and respond to the impact of recent changes to the welfare and benefit systems on the people, services and communities of Scotland, especially vulnerable people and groups. And I couldn't agree more, and I'm very glad that um, there is a group looking at this issue, and I think the response to the Stage 1 report shows that consensus can be achieved across the Chamber in such an important issue for Scotland. I do take issue with the CAB's title in the press release. It says, New Group aims to investigate Scotland's broken welfare system. I would have to say, if it was Scotland's system, I don't think it would be broken. Indeed, if it was Scotland's system, it would be day to the night of austerity. Welfare cuts from Westminster. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I now call on Alex Riley to be followed by Kevin Stewart. A generous six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'll also um, rise to speak in support of the, the first stage of this bill coming, coming forward um, to date. It is interesting in terms of the, the Minister said that one of the, the key objectives is to um, produce a reliable safety net or put a reliable safety net in place. And if we look at the, the figures for 13-14, um, the Scottish Government's own figures show that 82,200 crisis grants were paid out to some 56,000 households, while 36,000 community care grants were awarded to 33,000 applicants, um, some receiving both. And so while it's a safety net, those figures are quite staggering. And and starting off and make a contribution to this debate, I would want us to, to be absolutely clear that while we need to be tough on poverty and this welfare fund is there to support people who are um, suffering from poverty, we also need to be tough on the causes of poverty. It's well than more than half a century ago since Beveridge came forward and set out the plan to create, to attack all the five giants, the five evils we want, squalor, ignorance, idleness, and disease, and yet here we are today in 2014, where we have people that are falling below the safety net to the tune of 82,000 crisis grants and 56,000 homes and 36,000 community care grants being awarded. So tough on poverty 
but tough on the causes of poverty. And therefore, it's crucial that the government ensures that there's an anti-poverty strategy that runs through every part of the work that it does. And that then runs through every part of government, including local government and working with their communities. I know that most of the briefings that we've had in terms of this paper um, broadly welcome the, the, paper, the, the bill itself. And I would also congratulate Michael uh, Machen and the committee on the, the work that they carried out, because I think that's been a good contribution um, to taking this bill forward. And I welcome also the fact that the Minister has announced today that there will not be the outsourcing um, continuing within this bill. I know that, that Alec Johnson still stands by the argument that he made previously, but hopefully some of his colleagues um, on the benches here will, will um, have changed their mind and will now support that being the position as was put forward by the chairman of the committee. If I could focus on the, um, some of the briefing that came forward for the Poverty Alliance, because again, I think they set out some important points that I hope we can pick up as this bill progresses through the parliament. In terms of accessibility, there is a number of points that, that, that are made there. One about publicising the fund and just how, how aware people are that the, the fund is actually there. Because there was, I know, a 12% underspend in the fund in 2013-14, and yet there are higher levels of deprivation and poverty out there that that would be difficult to explain. So there needs to be a greater... Um, a greater um, publicist and of, of the, 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 the fund itself. And there are increasing numbers of people that are experiencing pressures um, and, and families that are having to face the cost of life, the, the, the cost of living um, crisis that, that is, is out there. And again, there is an argument being made that, that in terms of looking at the grants, that should, these should be widened to include families experiencing exceptional pressure. There are a lot of families out there at this current time um, experiencing pressure. Um, and also in terms of the eligibility criteria, I remember in a, a former job sitting on a social work committee that every time the budget became more and more under pressure, the eligibility criteria changed in order to manage the budget. So we do need to, I think, look at the eligibility criteria and take on board the views that are coming forward to us. The Minister mentioned the fact that, that this, this, um, this fund had been in place since 2013 and we were now coming with the legislation. But that's perhaps uh, got an advantage to it, which is that the committee have been able to hear from people and organisations that have been um, supporting people to access this fund. And therefore, hopefully, we're learning from that some of the issues. In terms of stigma, the Poverty Alliance give a quote here for someone who said, I felt small simply because I was poor did not mean uh, I, I should have no choice. Um, and, and I think that's an important point to pick up. And Jackie Bailey made the point that, that we are, and the recommendation indeed coming from, from the Poverty Alliance is that awards should be issued in cash unless it is not in the interest of the individual. And I do hope the, the Minister will, will pick that point up. But my ambition is to drive people out of poverty so they don't need to have um, access to such funds. There should be no stigma attached to it. And we need to ensure that people are treated with properly and respect when going forward for these types of grants. Likewise, it's been highlighted about the appeals process and indeed the number of appeals that, that, that did not take place. Were people aware of that? Is the support in place? Again, I would hope that some of the, some of the briefings that are coming forward will um, be picked up in terms of that. I've already welcomed the fact that the Minister has said today that they will not outsource, and that's certainly to be welcomed. The only other point I very briefly pick up, presiding officer, is this question about the variation between local authorities. And I do think that that, that needs to be looked at. Even if you look at the, 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 the CARE grant and, and the average, the average
average approximately in, in, in Glasgow was £900, whereas the Scottish average was £640. So we do need to have some kind of clear advice and clear criteria that's in place so that it does not end up being a postcode lottery. I certainly support local authorities administering this, but there needs to be some clear guidelines in place. And again, I hope the Minister will pick up some of the issues that are being raised in this area as the Bill uh, progresses through the Parliament. Many thanks. I now call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Willie Rennie, a generous six minutes. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I welcome uh, the fact that we are in the first stage of putting the Scottish Welfare Fund uh, on a statutory uh, footing. Um, and I agree uh, with uh, Councillor Norman Macdonald of Kenyon and Yellen Shar, who says legislation will give certainty not just to local authorities but to the clients about what is in place. It does, however, sadden me, uh, presiding officer, uh, that we have to do such a, a thing here. It saddens me uh, that we are seeing £6 billion worth of cuts to families in Scotland due to the Tory uh, Liberal welfare reforms. And uh, Mr Johnson uh, described himself earlier as... Uh, uh, the pantomime villain of the Welfare Reform Committee. Uh, but there's nothing pantomime about the policies that are emanating from his government in Westminster that are creating real difficulties uh, in our society. Um, I welcome the fact that to over 2015-16, uh, this government will put £100 million into mitigating uh, welfare reform. But the realities quite simply are that this is a drop in the ocean compared to that £6 billion cut. And what are the realities? What is happening out there? What are real people facing? Well, the other week I was in the Trussell Trust food bank um, in the Seaton area of my constituency. And we know um, from Trussell Trust that over the past year, use of their food banks in Scotland has risen by 400%. We know that last year, over 22,000 children had to rely on three-day emergency food parcels from Trussell Trust. I know from the folks that I spoke to that day that not only have they been relying on food banks, but they have also had the need to access the Scottish Welfare Fund. I spoke to one woman whose benefits have been sanctioned for over two years, who is entirely reliant on friends, on family, and things like the Scottish Welfare Fund and support from the Trussell Trust. I spoke to two young families, both of whom uh, husbands were in work, who are reliant on food banks and uh, on things like the Scottish Welfare Fund because they are not paid enough. And it is a real shame that this Parliament does not have control over the minimum wage, uh, which I would have liked to have seen, which would have helped, I think, to eradicate poverty, as Mr Rowley uh, uh, and I uh, want to see. That £6 billion pounds of cuts, £6 billion, pounds, is having a real effect on our society. And I do, as I say, welcome our £100 million pound commitment from the Scottish Government. But what we actually need to do is to ensure that that government in Westminster goes uh, and that whatever replaces it changes tack. And I think the only way that we will see that is with strong SNP representation. Um, at Westminster uh, next year. Let's look at some of the issues in the bill itself. And there has been uh, debates today uh, round about outsourcing. And I think all members of the committee, without a doubt, uh, were against privatisation of the Scottish Welfare Fund, apart from, of course, the pantomime villain, uh, Mr Johnson. Um, uh, and I'm glad that the Minister uh, has ruled that out uh, completely here today. 
Um, that is, of course, unlike the Welsh Labour administration, um, who have, of course, given all of their welfare funds over to a private company. Their social fund is being dealt with by a private company. So um, there's a certain degree of hypocrisy uh, coming from the Labour uh, benches today. Also, of course, uh, we heard from Ms Bailey um, about the underspend that there was at the beginning of this fund. Um, and, you know, uh, as Mr Johnson rightly pointed out, when folks heard that the social fund was going, uh, they were not, often not told about its replacement. Um, but, Ms Bailey, no, I won't, because you didn't take an intervention for me, and I'm sorry to be so petty, but um, this is the way uh, that you operate all of the time, Ms Bailey, in not taking interventions. Uh, the reality is, quite simply, that 120 per cent of the funding provided to the Scottish Government uh, was paid out uh, in that year. Uh, and I think that compares very favourably to the fact that the Welsh Government, the Labour-controlled Welsh Government, only managed to pay out 70% of the funding uh, that they received. <laughs> Presiding officer, I think one of the most important things uh, to ensure that people have a trust uh, in the Scottish Welfare Fund is to have an uh, uh, appropriate appeals process. And I'm glad that the Scottish uh, Public Service is Ombudsman, the SPSO, will take over um, the second tier uh, of appeals. Uh, and I share the view of Derek Young of Age Scotland, who said, our firm view is that if second tier reviews cannot be done at a Scotland-wide level, no structural dynamic will ensure consistency. I also believe that that um, SPSO situation can lead to improvements of the fund. And I share the view of Mark Ballard of Bernardo's, who says the great virtue of the overall review structure is that it enhances learning and the dissemination of best practice models which can be ta taken up across the board. So I welcome um, the, uh, the fact that we are moving to put this fund onto a statutory footing. I welcome the fact that this government is here is doing what I, it can to mitigate welfare reform. But I will continue to oppose the £6 billion plus cuts uh, that the poorest in our society are having to face because of a harsh Tory Liberal government at Westminster. Thank you, President Officer. Thanks so much. And I now call on Willie Rennie to be followed by Richard Lyle. And I enjoy listening to Alex Riley's contribution um, because what he did is he reminded us that actually we do need to think in the wider context about why many people find themselves in these circumstances and what we can do in a holistic sense to try and tackle the five, ev the five evils that Beveridge um, highlighted. I'm not sure if he wanted to echo Tony Blair and his famous quote from the past, but it was opposite for today because we do need to consider though the, the poverty as well as the causes of poverty in itself. We welcome uh, this bill. It entrenches the fund that already exists, given a statutory underpinning so that clients, so that people, so that councils, so that local authorities can have the confidence that this is going to be a permanent feature for the long term. So we support the principles um, of the bill today. It also, I want to thank the committee um, for the work that they've done, sometimes the harrowing evidence that they receive um, from people who've been affected by um, welfare. Um, and that's why um, I thank the committee for the work that they have done, also taking evidence from local authorities and the frontline organisations in the third sector. This is um, a precursor of what's more to come. Jackie Bailey, and if she wants to take an intervention, I'm quite happy to let her in, unlike some others, because I'm a bit of a souk on these occasions. Um, but um, Jackie Bailey is right. We are creating a new Scottish welfare system with the DLA, the PIP, the attendance allowance, the discretionary housing payments, the universal credit flexibilities, the ability to create new benefits, and I can give Bob Doris the assurance, no clawback. The intention was clearly from the Smith Commission that there should be no clawback. If there is um, a benefit, a top-up, a supplement, whatever it is here, there should be no um, effect uh, down south. In a generous sense, I'll give way to Bob Doris. Bob Doris. Not usually Miss Bailey you wanted to speak to this afternoon. Um, I, I'm, I welcome that you've given that guarantee. Does that guarantee extend to any 
new benefits we might, we might want to give vulnerable groups, for example, maybe in receipt of, say, income support, which are means-tested benefit. There will definitely be no clawback in any of that cast-iron guarantee. Don't, the, the, um, the, intention, the intention is very clear within the Smith Commission there should be no clawback. I'm sure there will be issues that come up on the edge that we don't expect over time. But the principle, the guarantee is there, the intention and the commitment is given from the UK government and the UK parties that this is what our intention. So every effort, I'm not going to take another mention, got another few points that we, I'm sure we can discuss this at a future occasion. But the intention is quite clear that this should be the case. But this is a precursor of what's more to come. And it's a steep learning curve, as Alex Johnson has rightly said. We're grappling with issues that Westminster and the Department of Work and Pensions have been grappling with for some time, including stigma, quite rightly raised by Inclusion Scotland. That kind of balance between suspicion versus threat, sorry, trust and respect. I think that's something that everybody would want is a, as a system that has that trust and respect. But in reality, in practice, it's an awful lot more difficult to do. So the fine words uttered in this chamber need to be reflected in local authorities. And I think it's important we send that message out. But we also need to work out what are the triggers, the mechanisms and the training that is required to make sure that is enacted. Another aspect is the gatekeeper aspect. And I suppose it actually has some connection to what Bob Doris was referring to. You know, is there some kind of, you know, people fear that they shouldn't apply or the local authorities deter people from applying for particular funds because perhaps the DWP has seen at fault um, for the reason why the person is um, without funds. Now, that's obviously something that we should um, discourage, but you can understand why a local authority might feel that way, that they wouldn't want their funds to be affected because of a mistake by another authority. Um, so again, we need to make sure that the principles are pretty well entrenched so that local authorities understand that they should help if somebody is in need, no matter who is to blame for the problem. Another issue um, raised by Inclusion Scotland is about the, the normal residence and, and how that would affect gypsy travellers. Um, and I would like some kind of reassurance from the Minister that gypsy travellers' human rights will not be affected um, by that, um, that phrase, and perhaps a review of that phrase um, might be appropriate um, over time. Um, we should be striving to at least have a standard and a practice that is as good as, if not better, than Department of Work and Pensions. And that's why I would urge the government to look again at the 24 hours versus the 48 hours issue about waiting times for the crisis loans. And I think that's where it's important, the, sorry, the crisis grants. Because um, if you apply for um, such a fund on a Friday, and it's 48 hours and the clock doesn't start ticking until the weekend's over, somebody could be waiting for some quite considerable period of time before they can access the funds. So I would hope that the minister, while I'm sure local authorities will try to process those applications as quickly as possible, we should be setting a standard here that means that they act as quickly as possible um, by the law. Um, the Child Poverty Action Group are quite rightly raising the issue about families under exceptional pressure. And I would urge the Minister to look at that and whether it needs to be on the face of the bill so that people can be given confidence. Because the, the figures with um, comparison with Westminster are quite striking. 20% versus 50% and over 50% in fact. That is quite a stark comparison. I'd like to understand the reasons why that is the case. And perhaps putting on the face of the bill might encourage more families under exceptional pressure to actually apply uh, for such funds. Um, and finally, on the SPSO appeal process, I think that makes eminent sense to have a body that's removed from local, local authority to be able to make the judgment. And actually not just dealing with the process, but as Jackie Bailey says, dealing with the substance of the application as well. Because sometimes the process may be perfect, but the judgment might still be wrong. So therefore, I think it's appropriate to have that wider powers, which is not the normal way that the SPSO considers these matters. So Liberal Democrats, we support um, this bill. We we think there are an awful lot more difficult issues to come, and I think today's, today's debate is an indication of some of those difficult issues that this Parliament will need to come to terms with and make judgments, difficult judgments, but ones that are necessary if we're going to create that new Scottish welfare system that we can all be proud of. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, now call on Richard Lyle to be followed by Joan McAlpine.
Six thank, to seven minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. I also welcome taking part in this debate as it is a situation that touches all communities in Scotland, not just my own constituency of the Central Region. When the Department of Work and Pensions decided to abolish elements of the discretionary social fund, namely crisis loans for living expenses and community care grants, this Government rightly had to look at how to replace the DWP's one-size-fits-all approach with a service that was fairer to those who used it and contributed to Scottish policy priorities, such as tackling child poverty and reducing homelessness. As those in the Chamber know, this new service has been in place in an in an interim basis since April of this year. The Scottish Welfare Fund aims to steer people towards a range of social services as well as helping people in a financial crisis or enabling them to lead a more settled life by providing essential household goods. The Scottish Welfare Fund is a discretionary budget limited scheme that prioritises applications according to need and the grants provided do not need to be repaid at any time. Local authorities have the discretion to provide support in different ways, not always providing grants and cash payments. This support may take the form of vouchers, a household fuel card or furniture if they think that is the way to meet the need of the applicant. I personally would support a cash payment, not vouchers, which, uh, which I would suggest and I agree with, as already has been said, would cause embarrassment to the applicant. In essence, the Scottish Welfare Fund aims to provide a safety net in an, in an emergency where there is an immediate threat to health and safety, to enable people to live independently or continue to live independently, preventing the need for institutional care. This also providing assistance to families facing exceptional pressures. As members will be aware, the interim Scottish Welfare Fund was designed to take advantage of local delivery while maintaining a national character. Local authorities are able to supplement funding from Scottish ministers, however, are under no obligation to do so, with the intention being for the funds to link to other local services, therefore providing an overall better service to vulnerable members of the local community. With this in mind, the most common services that applicants are referred to for are advocacy, welfare rights, housing and money or, and debt management. The Scottish Welfare Fund, despite only being in place on an interim basis, has already helped, I am led to believe, over 100,000 households. And this bill will put the fund on a statutory basis to ensure that this vital help continues for the people of Scotland. The Scottish Government has also shown its commitment to the Welfare Fund by topping it up by a further £9 million, as already has been stated, which will be maintained, I am sure, in 2015-16. I welcome the announcement made by the Minister made earlier uh, in the debate and the Scottish Government's commitment to the Scottish Welfare Fund as in contrast, contrast to what is happening south of the border. In England, the discretionary fund, social fund has been abolished and the funding has been provided to local authorities to provide funding for local welfare assistance schemes. However, the funding for this has not been ring-fenced and no duty has been placed on the local authorities to provide such schemes. Furthermore, the UK Government plans to withdraw dedicated funded funding to local authorities for the scheme from April 2015. This will result in many local authorities having to scale back, English local authorities having to scale back or to scrap completely their local welfare fund provision. It is my view, and I know it's shared by many of my colleagues in this chamber today, that this is completely unacceptable. Anyone who should be living in poverty in a country as wealthy as Scotland in light of this, I was pleased to see that this Government is doing something about it by providing £104 million in next year's budget to tackle poverty equality, inequalities and to help those affected by welfare changes. I was particularly pleased to note that in 2015-16, the Scottish Government also uh, will provide £35 million to allow the full mitigation of, to my mind, the hated bedroom tax for the 71,000 people affected in Scotland. Presiding officer, I'm pleased to be able to say that I am a, party, uh, a member of a party that stands up for those in welfare, as opposed to the Tories and to the Labour who have signed up a further welfare cut after the general election. Very, as already has been said by my, my colleague uh, 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 Kevin Stewart, extensive over £6 billion of cuts. 
Save the Children has estimated that over the next four years, the welfare spending cap will push an additional 345,000 children across, to, uh, across UK into poverty. This is completely unacceptable in this day and age. And I am glad that this SNP government is committed to doing what it can to protect, protect the most vulnerable in Scotland. Can I uh, really a, a story from a number of years ago? As a councillor, uh, I was called out on Christmas Day to a house in my ward, which had went on fire. The lady was left without a home, clothes, etc. Everything was destroyed. Luckily, no one was injured in that fire. The lady, whilst being rehoused, was left to wait for a crisis loan, to wait several weeks, and the point was made by Mr Rennie very ably in regards to when they apply and when the, the, the loan is paid out can be some time. This new bill, I would suggest, will help people like that lady in the situation that she was in. I hope and I'm sure that the, this government will take all the powers it can and all the help it can give to people who are in that situation because we have to ensure that people who are in crisis are helped by their government and by the politicians. We all wish to help uh, people in poverty. Uh, as I said before, we have a country which is rich in oil, but we have people who are still in poverty. That is not right, and we should do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on John McAlpine to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to speak today in this Stage 1 debate on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. I am, of course, a new member of the Welfare Committee and was not present when they took evidence on the Bill, but I endorse the report they have compiled at Stage 1. And it's a reflection on the diligence with which the Committee goes about its work that the Government has indicated already that it intends to bring forward amendments to make absolutely sure that the Fund cannot be outsourced to third-party organisations in particular the private sector. I know that was never the Minister's intention, but it is correct that she has responded to concerns and makes things absolutely watertight in this regard. I may be a new member of the Welfare Committee, but like every other MSP in this chamber, I'm all too familiar with the dire consequences of UK government welfare reform on some of our most vulnerable citizens. We should all be very proud, presiding officer, that this parliament, working with local government, has stepped in to provide a local safety welfare net in Scotland. The fund has already helped over 100,000 households, as has been mentioned several times, and putting it on a statutory basis will ensure that this vital help continues. It is true that the discretionary elements of the former social fund were uh, abolished, uh, but uh, the funding was devolved. Um, however, it has been, as others have mentioned, topped up by the Scottish Government by £9 million a year, and I, am, I'm, I welcome the fact that that will be maintained in 2015-16. It's worth noting at this point, Presiding Officer, that the Scottish Government was under no obligation uh, to use the funds to set up a welfare fund for people in crisis, but it reflects well across this Parliament that we work together to meet this need. And it beggars belief, presiding officer, that in England, unlike Scotland, the funding for local welfare assistance scheme, schemes is not ring-fenced and no duty has been placed on local authorities to provide such schemes. A survey of councils in England by the Local Government Association in October found that three quarters of council areas plan to scale back or scrap their local welfare provision next year, while one in 10 or 15% plan to scrap their local schemes entirely, which really is a, a very frightening prospect for the vulnerable people living in those areas. Turning to the committee report, uh, I'm aware that uh, others have uh, addressed its recommendations in detail. It welcomes the general principles of the bill and makes some helpful, helpful suggestions um, about the operation of the fund to date, um, which I hope will make it work even better um, in particular, respond to the needs of vulnerable people in a sensitive and appropriate manner. 
I was struck by reading the report that signposting of the fund has been a problem in the past, and that came across quite strongly to those members who recently atte uh, attended a Child Poverty Action Group uh, event in the Parliament uh, about uh, welfare reform. Signposting is improving, and that's obviously reflected in the take-up of funds, but more needs to be done. When the committee took evidence from fund users, they stated that no one had heard about the, the, the no one had heard about the fund through their local authority. Many were signposted by a third sector organisation that they were already working with, or by a friend or family member. And some users were unaware that crisis funds uh, hadn't actually been abolished altogether, but had uh, been uh, reconstituted in the Scottish Welfare Fund. When asked what was the best way to inform potential applicants to the fund, users said that a key point was when they were starting a new tenancy. They suggested that the housing association or landlord could give them information about the fund at this key point. I, I therefore agree with paragraph 106 of the committee's report, which recommends that all social housing providers get information on the Scottish Welfare Fund to be passed to new tenants. The committee acknowledged that private rented tenants are harder to reach, but very sensibly suggests that information could be provided to landlords when registering or through various tenancy deposit schemes. The committee also welcomed the assurances of the Minister, as do I, that she will look at ways to improve the flow of information on the fund between local authority departments. Uh, and, uh, as I said earlier, Clearly, we're making progress on that all the time. And the committee also made some other practical suggestions, for example, reviewing the length of the application form uh, for the fund. Uh, research by the Scottish Government itself shows that one in five applicants to the Scottish Welfare Fund have an identified vulnerability. One in three have children. For those applying for a crisis grant, mental health difficulties featured significantly. And those applying for community care grants tended to be lone parents, again those suffering from mental illness, homeless people and people with a physical disability. And in those circumstances, um, we should do everything in our power to make it easy for those people and not distressing to have to get the funds they need when they are at some, the lowest point in their life. And obviously, long, complicated application forms don't help that. Presiding officer, I agree with those today who have said that they support this bill with a heavy heart. We should not have to pass such legislation. In a fairer society, we would not need to pass such legislation. Others have noted that uh, 100,000 uh, £100 million, pounds, rather, will be used to mitigate welfare reform uh, by this government. Yet, um, it's clear that this is a bottomless pit. My colleague Kevin Stewart, MSP, pointed out that families in Scotland will be hit by £6 billion pounds of benefit cuts in the five years to 2014. And the autumn statement suggests that there is worse to come. But even if you take the £6 billion pounds to 2014 in, the fa in those five years, that, is, that equals 1.2 billion a year. Uh, that's the equivalent of the entire budget of NHS Lothian, for example. Uh, and no amount of mitigation that this parliament can do can really address the devastating cuts that are coming uh, from the UK um, and hitting the most vulnerable people in society. And while I welcome uh, what others have said about some of the new benefits uh, uh, being suggested in the Smith Commission, you need to have the ability to pay for those benefits. And in my view, not enough has been done to give this Parliament all the powers it needs to address uh, what Alex Rowley identified as uh, the causes of poverty rather than the effects of poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Bob Doris. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I refer members to my register of interests? Um, I also welcome this bill, but I can't help wishing we didn't need it. It's absolutely wrong that in a rich society we still have people struggling for the very basics they need for survival, to keep the roof over their head and to live independently. Food banks are becoming the norm rather than the exception. And despite this, we have an underspent welfare fund last year, and I think that is a bit of a disgrace for all of us, and we need to do something about it. 
The Scottish Government commissioned a report into the operation of the Welfare Fund uh, from Heriot Watt University. This bill, or secondary legislation, needs to deal with the issues raised. It is startling that most of the applicants only knew of the fund through professionals or by word of mouth, and there appears to be little or no local or national advertising of the fund. And that was a point echoed by the committee report. Witnesses acknowledged that work needed to be carried out to raise awareness of the fund and its availability. Witnesses also told the committee that they had been unaware of the fund despite needing to access money in an emergency. We can't be sure that everyone who might need access to the fund is in touch with the statutory services and the professionals that know about it. Uh, we know anecdotally that many people accessing food banks, for example, are the working poor. They are less likely to be dealing with the statutory services, less likely to be claiming benefits and may, might not know that crisis loans are available. The committee also pointed out that there was a case for those um, that this was the case for those wishing to access the fund. They might not be in the system and therefore be unaware that the, the fund was there in the first place. While there was agreement that more could be done locally to raise awareness, I would ask and suggest that we maybe have a national advertising campaign to make sure everyone is aware that the fund is there. There are also concerns about the amount of discretion available for decision makers with regard to loans. There is also evidence that people were being discouraged from even applying, and I think this is unforgivable, especially given the fund was underspent last year. I was interested in what the committee said about eligibility to apply for the fund. They suggested the criteria should be widened to disabled people who would not be able to live independently without a grant, to all young people who had been looked after by the state, and in that I think they included kinship care, uh, people that had experienced kinship care, but also those uh, delivering kinship care for members of their families and indeed friends, children. And of course to families, many of whom were suffering uh, most of the impact of welfare reform. Surely anyone likely to become homeless or be unable to live independently needs to be eligible to apply. It also seems to me that if we're really serious about ch tackling child poverty, surely families need to be eligible. There were also concerns in the report um, about the use of gatekeepers who put people off applying in the first place or turned down applications without adequate consideration. And these cases go unrecorded and have no right of appeal. It's sad that we presided over an underspent budget last year without any real idea of who had applied and who, were, who was turned down. All applications need to be considered fully. Every application denied needs the reasons for that decision in writing, but also needs to be told of their right to request a review. Uh, given the reluctance due to stigma of many people to apply for these loans, they tend only to come from people who have nowhere else to turn, and this should mean that we should have more positive outcomes. The results of decisions that were subject to review tend to bear this out. The committee also looked at um, how the grant could be paid, be it through the provision of goods, vouchers or cash, and all seem to have good and bad points. But I think, like many others in this debate, I believe that cash should be the default position. It's often the case, however, that those sourcing goods are not always able to access the best deals. And that, this is especially the case in rural areas where people maybe don't have uh, access to the internet and the like. And in those cases, the provision of goods is a very good idea, as long as the recipient is involved in that choice and has a say in what those goods are and indeed what their functions are so that they are suitable with their family. I can also see where vouchers might be useful there are some very vulnerable people due to addiction, and it might be that if they were given cash, they could be tempted to use that money for alcohol and drugs, and especially when their circumstances are such that they are needing to apply for the fund in the first place. However, I would have to say that the use of vouchers needs to be discussed with the applicant and only used in a way that respects their dignity but also supports them while acknowledging the problems they face. And I think it's really important that we must help people to succeed rather than setting them up to fail. 
Presiding officer, a number of people in the debate, Alec Rowley, Willie Rennie and others, um, talked about the causes of poverty. And I think it's really important when we're looking at a, a bill that will tackle um, some of the extremes that causes poverty, we should also look at the causes of poverty itself. We know that every child growing up in poverty has their life chances damaged, and therefore we need to deal with it. And there are many things this Parliament can do to deal with poverty. We can tackle low wages, we can tackle unemployment, and we can tackle the lack of an affordable childcare. Those are things and very practical steps we could be taking uh, here and now, and not waiting for uh, decisions to be taken elsewhere. I welcome the Minister's uh, change of heart regarding co contracting out and I hope that she listens to the, the concerns raised in the debate and maybe includes some of those concerns within amendments for the bill. The bill is welcome but we need to make sure it covers everybody that finds themselves in extreme circumstances and who need help from the fund. Many thanks. I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Rob Gibson. Presiding officer, um, may I begin by commending the Welfare Reform Committee for its constructive scrutiny of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, in particular the steady leadership of Michael McMahon and his former Vice Convener Jimmy Hepburn, now of course elevated to ministerial office, I think was an example of working across party to provide constructive and challenging scrutiny where needed, and it does this Parliament a, a great credit, I, I, I believe. I uh, am pleased that uh, my most direct experience of the interim Scottish Welfare Fund demonstrated an efficient and effective referral been taken from myself over the telephone after a vulnerable woman walked into my campaign rooms in, in Maryhill Road a few months ago. She had been sanctioned by the DWP and was unsure when she would have recourse to public funds again. The woman was three months pregnant. Thank goodness the Scottish Welfare Fund was there at that time of crisis, and it worked well in that situation. Of course, it has to work well in every situation, and the report looks at ways of making sure it happens consistently well, and I get that and understand that. But that traumatic experience at least had the Scottish Welfare Fund there to pick up the pieces to an extent. Let us be clear, when the UK Government abolished the discretionary social fund in April 2013, it was actually a political choice to reinstate it in Scotland. It did not have to be done, and I am proud of this Parliament, this Scottish Government, that it decided to do so. Uh, and I was disgusted that the UK Government took a political choice itself to cut the social fund money available when it passed the responsibility of that area to Scotland. And thankfully, the Scottish Government, with cross party support, topped up that cash by £9 million so that our most vulnerable would not lose out any more than they already are. There has been a mention of whether there would be a widening of criteria to support those who do not or may not qualify for the fund. And I note that the Welfare Reform Committee raised, looked at that issue, raised that issue, but crucially did not overtly support that position. Indeed, it took no set view. I believe that was a very prudent decision of the Welfare Reform Committee. The Scottish Government is already spending £100 million a year to try and mitigate the devastating effects of UK welfare reform, reform on Scotland's most vulnerable. That is, of course, cash that could otherwise be spent on a whole series of other priorities across government as Scotland feels the full strain of UK austerity, be it local authorities, be it our colleges. The wish list that comes from politicians across chamber for more money to be spent is, is limitless. But that's £100 million spent on our most vulnerable, which I believe is the right choice that is spent on that because of UK cuts to Scotland that could, in theory, be spent elsewhere if different political decisions were taken at Westminster. Let me just give two examples of, of that austerity that, that's biting. So, child and working tax credits. There's 100,000 homes in Scotland that are around £700 a year worse off because of UK reforms in that area. People in inward poverty on the breadline who often have to have recourse to, to food banks and the like, or the 100,000 working-age adults who are set to lose at least £1,120 and be worse off because of changes to disability benefits in that area. I think Kevin Stewart gave a, the figure in relation to the overall 
uh, welfare reforms, a, a £6 billion cash cut to Scotland in, in five years. Let's put the Scottish Welfare uh, Fund in some kind of context. It's £38 million a year. So we shouldn't pretend when we talk about extending the criteria of the Scottish Welfare Fund that it's going to tackle that £6 billion. That would be the great lie, the great deception to the poor and vulnerable in Scotland. It's like putting a finger in a dam to stem a tsunami. You just can't do it. I do also have concerns, and I raised them earlier, in relation to not necessarily the Smith Commission itself, but in terms of topping up benefits or creating new benefits to U complex UK welfare rules and the potential of clawback. But, of course, to top up or create new benefits as well, you actually have to have the money to do it in the, in the first place. Uh, Child Poverty Action Group was quoted as saying that families under exceptional pressure uh, could perhaps apply to the Scottish Welfare Fund. Maybe they could. Maybe they could. But would the 100,000 homes that are £700 worse off, would they be families under exceptional pressure? Would the 100,000 disabled homes for their families who are £1,120 worse off, would they be termed as under exceptional pressure? Let's be very careful. Let's be very clear. If we can identify resources, if we can identify additional criteria to help the most vulnerable, then please, across party, let's do it. But let's not sell the big lie that that £38 million, that finger in the dam of a tsunami that's sweeping across Scotland, is going to plug that £6 billion gap. It's simply not. Presiding officer, people know what the solution uh, of my party and the Scottish Government is in relation to that. And in the context of the Scottish Welfare Fund and this Stage 1 bill today, I do have to say again, Smith doesn't even scratch the surface of defending the most vulnerable people in Scotland and getting them off of benefits and into work or out of, out of in-work poverty into prospering in-work. But short of the powers that I think are needed, we must do all we can across party, irrespective of our various views, to do all we can to help the most vulnerable. And I believe that's what this new Scottish Welfare Fund, put in statute, or rather an interim basis, will do. And I commend it uh, this afternoon to the Chamber. Many thanks. I now call on Rob Gibson to be followed by Anne McTaggart. Well, thank you very much, President Officer. A lot has been said, uh, mostly in support of the Scottish Welfare Fund being put onto a statutory basis, and I very much welcome this uh, Stage 1 report, which lays out the details, and uh, to the work of the Welfare uh, Reform Committee, which has been able to uh, get the kind of evidence which shows just why this is needed. I would like to uh, concentrate, first of all, just now on some examples from my constituency and from the north of Scotland. Um, it has been said that some of the uh, actual uh, payouts in places like Glasgow have been higher than on average in some other parts, and yet in the north of Scotland we are talking about having dearer transport with further to go to services like hospitals, dearer parcel delivery. Dearer electricity with a 2p surcharge at the present time uh, on electricity, colder, wetter weather, uh, broadband difficulties, uh, and often lower wages than in the cities. And indeed, in my constituency, there are eight out of the 17 most deprived areas in Scotland, four of these in Wick. It means that we face the kinds of problems in spades, which many other areas do but because we are a much smaller population, less of it is noticed. But I have spoken with the Citizens Advice Bureaus in WIC, in Galsby and in Allness, in my constituency, about these matters uh, and uh, dealt with uh, issues like food banks, presiding officer. But I think when we see how much uh, the, the Citizens Advice Scotland has had to give advice on the Scottish Welfare Fund, some 7,400 pieces of advice in the last year, 2013-14, we can see that issues related to the social fund community care grants and crisis loans in this uh, uh, final year of operation of those at 8,300 is going to mean that, in fact, we're going to see far, far more people 
uh, lining up for advice, but we hope that the way in which this um, uh, Scottish Welfare Fund is now structured, that it will make it easier for people to access what help we can give, however tight that uh, is in terms of their real needs. And, uh, you know, talking about these real needs, Citizens Advice Scotland gave an example about general provisions, and I give you this as an example just now. In the north of Scotland, CAB reports of a client who received a community care grant, which was awarded in the form of goods. And other members have talked about this question, goods or cash or in kind. The client felt that they had no say in the decisions regarding their furniture and were ending up with unsuitable items. The client had requested a table, but as his flat is extremely small, would prefer a coffee table to a table and four chairs. The CAB called the Welfare Fund and with some difficulty organised the changes. However, it will have to be a new order, so the table and chairs may be delivered and then uplifted, and the coffee table will come later. These kinds of communication difficulties for people in dire need about basic furnishings in their house are, are something which are a function of the way in which this whole system works. And I mentioned the question of uh, dearer transport. And another example from the north of Scotland was of a client who called their local authority to apply for a crisis grant for travelling expenses to visit the father of her children who is very seriously ill in hospital in another part of the country. She was told she could not receive a grant to pay for travel expenses. The CAB advisor then spoke to the welfare fund person who explained that if the client could get the funds to pay for the travelling expenses and this caused her to be in a bad financial position, on her return she could apply for a crisis grant. The client decided to use the money she was going to spend on paying her bills to cover the travel costs and reapply for a crisis grant at a later stage. These kinds of options which are being forced on people who are utterly vulnerable is one of the most detrimental ways for families in our country to be treated and detrimental to their potential to become normal, tax-paying, in-work uh, persons in our community. And it is example, an example like that, which is a family in except, under exceptional pressure. But how far can we go to do Westminster's work because Westminster has decided to retain control of much of the benefits system and indeed uh, to cut these for, by £12 billion in the next government's time? Much, much worse than people have experienced in the last four years. And so, it brings me at this point to suggest that we need to discuss the issue that Jackie Bailey raised about the ability to create new benefits. Well, actually, if we had our way, we should be thinking about a very different approach, which would be about a basic social wage for each individual over the age of 16. Based on a progressive tax system, everybody could have such a basic social wage and it would allow them to make decisions not about eating or heating because they could afford the basics, but to go and look for work or training or whatever, knowing that their benefit was secure. And if we were in a position to be able to do that, then I believe it would be far better than creating new benefits and using only one side of the equation. A living wage and the ability to create work are the bits that Smith don't allow us to deal with. And that's why the whole argument about this stage one report about support is something which should never have happened had this been a fairer society. But since it isn't, I would like people to take account of the, the folk in my constituency. Four out of the 17 most deprived areas just in a small town like Wick, they need every help they can get. And I hope that this Welfare Fund Scotland Bill will do that for them, at least in part. Thank you. And I now call Anne McTaggart to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to contribute to the Stage 1 of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, which is hugely 
important and vital to many of my constituents in Glasgow. I am broadly in support of the general principles in the Welfare Funds Bill. However, there are a number of reservations which I and a number of support organisations are of the opinion will have to be addressed first. A principal aim of the Interim Scottish Welfare Fund, known as the SWF, is to provide a safety net in an emergency when there is an immediate threat to health and safety through the provision of a non-repayable grant, which is known as a crisis grant, and enable people to live independently or to continue to live independently, preventing the need for institutional care through the provision of a non-repayable grant, which is known as the Community Care Grant. This includes providing assistance to families facing exceptional pressures. An example of that um, could be where there has been a breakdown in the family relationships, perhaps involving domestic violence, which results in a move. However, although this is a vital issue, there has been no clear explanation or discussion by the government as to why the interim SWF fund was so underspent. I re reiterate the point others have made earlier, but I reckon it merits repeating, that in 2013, the SWF was underspent by 12%. Grants totalling £29 million were handed out by the Scottish Welfare Fund in 2013-14, amounting to only 88% of the £33 million that was available. Scottish Government figures show that over 82,000 crisis grants were paid out to 56,000 households, while 36,000 community care grants were awarded to 33,000 applicants. I am aware of the fact that Heriot Watt University has published a review highlighting a number of concerns regarding the interim scheme and proposed possible recommendations to these concerns. Although the applicants of the Community Care Grant found out about the SWF from their existing networks, in most cases such as their social workers or third sector organisations, the awareness of SWS among staff across these organisations was extremely varied. The report found that the applicants did not commonly find out about the SWF through local advertisements or online information. A number of the third sector respondents felt there was scope to greatly improve marketing to make people less dependent on the third sector or public sector providers for access and awareness of the scheme. I strongly believe that, as recommended in the report, local authorities should proactively signpost and advertise existing training, advice, support and consider developing some online training resources. Local authorities should also raise awareness of the SWF through information materials provided to their own departments, third sector agencies, Job Centre Plus and others. Another concern raised was that the third sector staff commonly felt that not all SWF staff fully appreciated the nature of the poverty and the vulnerability of applicants and, there were, and that there was an emphasis on strict adherence to rules and criteria rather than the discretion in the decision making process. There were also some worry that some applicants were discouraged from applying. This is a vital issue which should be addressed by the Scottish Government. And an example of how this could be addressed or how it could be achieved is through anonymised case studies being produced to provide examples of who has accessed the scheme and how it has helped them. This would provide third sector staff and applicants with useful insights into how discretion could or should be used. I also strongly believe that guidance on awarding dis discretionary grants is needed to ensure that people are treated equally across Scotland. I am aware that guidance is an ongoing problem with the SWF, which I note has been changed on numerous times and which will again change the passage of the, in the passage of the legislation. 
It is therefore vital that the Bill has to incorporate permanent guidance arrangements which would benefit from more clarity on the roles and responsibilities of the SWF. In conclusion, President Officer, although I am bro in broadly in agreement with the aims of the Welfare Funds Bill, the Scottish Government must clarify why there has been a repeated underspend in order to ensure that the SWF operates properly in the coming years and should also address the concerns I have raised and in order for this bill to fulfil its principal aim, which is to provide a safety net for the people on low income during a disaster or emergency through providing crisis grants. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Nigel Dawn. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have to say that I am enormously grateful to Bob Doris, who I thought put the whole thing in its context very eloquently. Because unfortunately, and Mr. Bob Doris made this point, as I, as I understood it, tens of millions in a fund is not going to deal with any more than scratching the surface of a problem which is measured in billions. And I think he's absolutely right to put this in that kind of context and say, look, we're doing a little bit, it's marginal, it's important, we need to get it right, but please let's not pretend that this is any more than that. What it is, perhaps, is the start of things to come because we're talking about crisis grants because crisis is the right word for the folk who need these. It's going to get worse. Public funding is going to drop, whether we like it or not. And we're going to have to get better at distributing it appropriately. And we're going to have to find ways of doing so efficiently and effectively. Section four of the bill refers to the second tier review by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman and several members have referred to this and I'd like to do so at slightly greater length. First of all, can I suggest that when you have a good review mechanism actually of anything, but certainly of anything lawful, then that actually improves the decisions. Anybody making an administrative decision is going to be looking over their shoulder and saying, who's checking this? And if they know the checking system is going to be good, then they're much more likely to think carefully and come to the right answer in the first place. So actually, review mechanisms are extremely important. And it's also very important that the review itself works well. And I'm sure the SPSO will do that. I also know that Jackie Bailey is right, and it's no surprise to say that Jackie Bailey is right, because, of course, what's in this bill is different for the SPSO. It's not about just reviewing. It actually has the opportunity to, or he, has the opportunity to overturn that, and that's what Section 4.4 tells us. And that's quite, in fact, it's actually very useful. It's what one would have expected. It does, however, beg the question of whether the other SPSO powers actually remain. But that is actually probably put in context by just looking at the very words which are there, which says at section 404, the Ombudsman may quash the decision and otherwise direct and direct uh, in another way. I do just put it, presiding officer, to the government, they might consider on reflection whether may quash is actually the right thing to have in here. Because it does seem to me that if the Ombudsman on reviewing it draws the conclusion that a different decision should have been made, then probably the Ombudsman should quash that decision rather than just may quash that decision. And then the options of directing the authority to reconsider or else deciding what the decision should have been are the normal ones you would have expected from a court anyway. So I just wonder whether the Minister might like to reconsider that. In that context, I also note that Section 61 of the stage one report, which I have to say I think is a model of, of report writing, and I thank the clerks for that, says that the SPO said in its written submission that it intends to ask the Scottish Government to include a provision in the legislation allowing the SPSO to produce rules after appropriate consultation showing how it will consider those reviews. Now, I'm sorry, presiding officer, but I'm struggling. The SPSO knows perfectly well how to do reviews. That's actually what it does. 
and any student of administrative law will be able to tell you the following, that you need an independent investigator, you assemble and review the information from both parties, you reach an objective and explicable decision, and you communicate that decision and its explanation to the parties. And you do all of that as fast as is reasonably practicable. Now, maybe I've missed something, but I'm not quite sure why the SPSA needs to consult on a set of rules, never mind have them provided for them, to do what is actually mainline stuff in its job. Section 5.2.F may not mean very much to the casual observer, but it is the very uh, subsection that talks about the circumstances under which accounts may require to be repaid or recovered. Several members have talked about the issue of fraud, uh, and I think it's a general recognition that where something has been obtained by fraud, it should be repayable. Uh, members have also commented that it would be good um, if that were clarified that that's the case. Can I, can I endorse that? It does seem to me that if Section 2F refers to fraud, or is meant to refer to fraud, then it would be a very good idea if it actually said so. Because if that is the reason why you might want to recover, then why don't we say so and take the ambiguity off the face of the bill? Sorry, I may be being very simple this afternoon, but there is, I think, some merit in actually saying what you mean. There was also correspondence uh, reaching us about the cost effectiveness of this whole process. And looking at the data which has been assembled, I hope I'm correct in saying that the average crisis grant is of the order of £80, and the average community care grant is of the order of 650 though I note comments from others that this does seem to vary quite considerably between local authorities. If those sums are anything like right, and I'm sure they are, then it really would pay local authorities to make sure that they have a pretty slick process for coming to these decisions. Because quite frankly, if it's costing very much to get those kind of sums out, it would be better simply to pay the money and, and, and not to have another person checking. Otherwise, there's a real risk we spend our time paying officials rather than paying those who are in crisis. And I think I'm echoing other people's comments on that as well. The same thing therefore applies to the idea of involuntary gatekeeping, to which again, members have referred Advisors in one capacity or another just saying to a possible claimant that it's just not worth it probably isn't terribly helpful. It might be very much better if they said, well, maybe you should just apply because actually if people are in crisis, then that's where the money should be going. And if we've got a sensible system for paying it out, then we should be trying, taking the opportunity of doing so. I've also taken a look, uh, actually look at those statistics uh, in, in, in the documents and they're online and... Uh, I think the statisticians might say they were very variable. They do seem to cover all four corners of the graph. I think the technical term is a plum pudding. The speed with which things are paid out, the amount that's paid out varies quite significantly across councils and the correlation doesn't seem to apply to, in the same way to, to, to different councils. Uh, I do think there is some consistency required in there. I'm quite sure the government would be aware of that. I'm not quite sure how they get it, because if it's delegated to councils, then clearly it is council's responsibility. Uh, but I think some consistency, some understanding of why the inconsistency is there would be helpful to all concerned. Finally, I'd pick up on the issue of the funding of signposters. Um, the various people, the CAB perhaps in particular, who are often the first port of call, apart perhaps from ourselves, uh, of those who need help. Uh, it does cost money to provide that kind of advice. It's important that advice is good and those facilities are available. Again, it's all about cost effectiveness. I'm not inviting the government to spend the money more than once, uh, but I do suggest that we do need to have a serious look at where the advice is coming from and making sure that's properly and effectively funded. Because at the end of the day, I'm sure every member of this chamber is going to share with me that whilst the sums involved are in the grand context of austerity, not huge, they are enormously important. They are dealing with people and families who are in crisis. And that system really needs to be good at the point of delivery. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the closing speeches, and I call on Alex Johnson around eight minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, this has been, uh, as we often say in these events, an interesting debate. It's a debate that has existed in two halves. 
There are those of us who have been talking about the legislation, the stage one report that is in front of us, and there are those who have been pursuing uh, a rather different agenda. But nonetheless, these two issues are of significance and importance, uh, and I welcome both and will take the opportunity to comment on both. Uh, the first uh, is to point out something which was pointed out by many, many during the debate but ignored by some, is that the predecessor scheme to the interim scheme, which is administered uh, by the Department of uh, Work and Pensions, it was of course not abolished but it was devolved. Yes, it was devolved and the funding came having been top sliced. But the £24 million that initiated the fund were the funds which came from that predecessor scheme. The further £9 million, which has been added by the Scottish Government, is welcome uh, and has made a significant difference to the ability of the scheme to cope with its demand. We have heard from a number of speakers concern about the fact that the scheme at the end of 1314 was £4 million underspent. Uh, I do not share, oh, of course, it is a disappointment that that £4 million was not spent, but I do not share the concerns that have been expressed by some. Uh, when you look at the record of the interim scheme, there was a great difficulty in getting the funds in place uh, or to people in the earlier part uh, of 13-14. And that was driven by the fact that many did not know what the scheme was, many did not know what the eventual funding level of the scheme was, and consequently some local authorities found it difficult to make awards in that early period. It has to be said that in the second half of that year, the scheme did perform uh, uh, much more more efficiently than it had done previously. Uh, and I think it is important to recognise that the scheme is now spending at the level it was supposed to spend, uh, and that £4 million, unfortunately, it was not spent, but uh, it was uh, underspent at a time when the scheme was building up. Yes. Alex Shiley. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alec Johnson, for giving way. Do you not agree that it is absolutely disgraceful in 2014 that we have over 100,000 people in Scotland having to access these kind of crisis grants that is there? And should we not be tackling poverty at, resource, at source rather than creating more poverty? Alex Johnson. I, I have tremendous respect for the view that Alec Rowley just expressed. But perhaps uh, the, the common view that we, we both have is that welfare payments should not be necessary because everybody should have a level of income above that requiring welfare payments is a basic on which we will always agree. But as we look at individual schemes, we have to recognise that some are there for one purpose, some for another. Uh, and what I would point out is that in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund, what we're doing is providing two methods of support, crisis grants, which are designed to provide a safety net when someone experiences a disaster or a health emergency, or as we heard from Anne McTaggart during her speech, a relationship breakdown perhaps due to domestic violence. Uh, these are things which will happen to individuals unexpectedly uh, and regardless uh, of their level of income. So I would suggest that that, for example, uh, is a measure of support which will remain necessary even if we achieve our objective of significantly cutting the level of welfare due to reduced demand. So I think this is a scheme which is uh, important and will continue to be important. The other purpose, of course, community care grants uh, are designed to uh, uh, enable independent living or continued independent living and prevent the need to go into care. I think that also is an example of an area of expenditure which is worthy and which will continue uh, to be a responsibility we need to take seriously, even if we can increase standards of living and reduce overall demand for welfare. So I think those who have criticised this scheme uh, in terms of their broader view on welfare, which I share, I think are wrong to criticise this particular provision because I think it would be important for us to continue to provide resources uh, for these purposes uh, into the future. Uh, if we look further uh, at the debate, 
Uh, one other thing that uh, Alex Rowley also mentioned was the issue of variation in performance between local authorities. Uh, and I think there takes us back to another version of a discussion I was having uh, with the Chamber uh, earlier in this debate, and that is about devolving decision-making to a local level. One of the purposes behind uh, even the, the Westminster Government's decision to pass this funding on down was to allow local decision-making, because local decision-making can be good. You can have good understanding of local needs, uh, and you can do it in a, a way that is appropriate and fits with local needs. But of course, Alec Rowley also used the phrase postcode lottery. You cannot have both things. It's going to be uh, one to one person and another to another person. Uh, we also heard the same issue raised in a slightly different way by Rob Gibson, who told us some horror stories that he'd come across in the Highlands. But my criticism of those who were responsible for administration is that the decision-making criteria are to a significant extent in their own hands. And if bad decisions are being made in a particular area, then perhaps it's time we actually work to ensure that best practice in the best areas of Scotland are understood and can be copied by those who are struggling to, uh, to, to get best practice in place and who appear to be making poor decisions. Also, on, the sub on Rod Gibson's contribution, some of the uh, broader criteria that he set out for uh, paying benefits uh, more generally uh, did begin to remind me of the terms that are the, the basis of the universal credit which uh, will be introduced progressively in years to come uh, and which has been the source of many a complaint in this chamber, but I believe could actually deliver a great deal of what Rob Gibson asked for. Rob Gibson. Uh, with all due respect, the idea is not to save money in terms of benefits, but to give people a basic social wage, which is paid out of progressive taxation on those who can afford to pay it and who don't pay enough at the moment. Alex Johnson. <laughs> Indeed. If we move on uh, to cover some of the, the briefer uh, briefly some of the other areas that were uh, discussed, there was, of course, the, the myth uh, put about that there has been somehow £6 billion worth of cuts, uh, which we heard from Kevin Stewart and others. Of course, it was clarified by others during the debate that that £6 billion has actually accrued over a total of five years, so in annual terms it's rather lower than £6 billion. Similarly, uh, the, in order to get that figure, uh, you have to count up all the cuts that are being made and not actually count any of the ways that money is being passed back. For example, we heard at some length how uh, the reduction in child and working tax credits has resulted in a £700 fall in income per household. Not taken into account, of course, the fact that raising the tax threshold will mean that these same households by April next year will have an additional £820 per household that wasn't taken into that calculation. Briefly, please, Mr Jones. Well, I've got direct constituency experience. I've got uh, families who had tax credits who are in employment who are now worse off in employment rather than being unemployed because of Tory changes to tax credits. Don't you think that's appalling? Alex Johnston. The balance between the reduction in tax credits and the increase in tax threshold should have delivered for the majority of householders. And if there are individuals who have suffered as a result, then we need to know about them. But that on balance, these figures that are quoted regularly are simply inaccurate. To close, I think it's important that we realise, as we move forward, that the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, are about to come into a great deal more power in order to be able to use uh, their resource to pay benefits, to pay welfare. But the system that we are about to enter in is one where, if you want to pay more, you will have to tax more. And many of the backbench speeches today have failed to address that prickly subject. And that is that if we choose to do something differently, then we will have to explain how that will be paid for. And yes, there's a great deal that we can do differently, but there's a great deal that we will have to find ways to pay for. So, De Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, I conclude by committing once again my support to this bill at five o'clock. 
Many thanks. And now Colin Ken McIntosh. Ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by thanking the Minister uh, for her foresight in instigating a debate on welfare reform within one hour of my promotion to the social justice brief, elevating me to closing uh, the debate. <clears throat> and can I also say to my uh, colleague, my predecessor, immediate predecessor in this role, Jackie Bailey, that she should read absolutely nothing into the fact that on a subject which is normally very fractious and disputatious, the tone of today's debate has in fact been uh, very uh, consensual, and there is no link between my appointment and the following uh, <laughs> comments and the tone. Oh, Mr. Dorn, yes. Nigel Dorn. Yes. Well, uh, can, can I just say to the member that I find his previous sentence very disappointing, because my experience indicates that that member probably will be very consensual, and I just hope that he's actually going to carry on being so, because it's much better that way. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Mr. Dorn. I was, in fact, being ironic, but... Uh, <laughs> Presiding officer, it is worth noting on that conditional note that both Labour and, in fact, every party in this chamber today supports the general principles behind this bill and uh, are going to vote for this legislation. In fact, although there, are, there have been uh, relatively heated discussions uh, between uh, SNP and Labour members on such matters in the Welfare Reform Committee, uh, we are actually in broad alignment in actually opposing the Tory welfare reforms and in taking action to mitigate their effect in Scotland, this bill being no exception. The bill is, in fact, a relatively straightforward measure. The UK government has decided to abolish the old social fund and to devolve the res responsibility for emergency welfare payments to Scotland and to local authorities in England, along with most, if not all, of the funding. The Labour Party supports the Scottish Government in passing on the administration of emergency welfare payments to our own, local authority, uh, our own local authorities. We support them in replacing the system of loans with one of grants and, crucially, in trying to make good at least some of that shortfall in funding. In taking evidence, the committee found a broad consensus uh, from most stakeholders, from welfare recipients, from local authorities and the voluntary sector to this general approach. Uh, I think it's fair to say there were a few misgivings expressed about the other notable feature of the bill, namely the appointment of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman as the body responsible for adjudicating on second-tier appeals. However, as several contributors have highlighted, I think we were also broadly in agreement that, on balance, this was probably the best-placed organisation to take on this task, given the circumstances. Now, that said, there have been a few issues which have emerged from the evidence and where the Scottish Government could undoubtedly make improvements to the bill. Um, the, the committee convener, Michael McMahon, for example, listed a few, including uh, to the importance of reviewing eligibility criteria, notwithstanding Bob Doris's uh, comments to defend this issue. Uh, the convener also highlighted uh, the need to reconsider redistribution of funding amongst local authorities and that the regulations should be subject to affirmative procedure. My own colleague Jackie Bailey also pointed out a very important issue, which is that the current fund has been underspent. So although the government has made funds available, if we don't actually make, uh, advertise their availability to recipients, then that is uh, not helping address the need that exists in Scotland. However, I want to focus on three issues in particular. The first, and the most notable, uh, was, of course, the very odd insistence initially from the Minister that she should take powers in the Bill which would allow her to privatise this service at some future date. Now, witnesses from the third sector were unanimous in opposing this measure and universally hostile to the prospect of allowing private companies to deliver state benefits for profit. In fact, given the very vocal comments of SNP backbenchers, both before and this afternoon, on this issue when it comes to Westminster, I don't think I was alone in being a little bit surprised that the SNP committee members voted to keep this proposal in the bill at stage one, rather than follow, rather than, oh, the very person, Mr Stewart, yes. Kevin Stewart. Mr McIntosh is well aware um, that SNP members uh, looked at outsourcing and the possibility of outsourcing to the third sector, which some of the third sector supported, but SNP members were clear all the way through that they would be against handing any of these contracts to private companies. Ken McIntosh. Uh, and that'll be why, that'll be why convener, uh, uh, presiding officer, that uh, Labour suggested removing it from the bill, but the SNP voted instead for this, this trenchant line. However, in light of the evidence received, 
The committee recommends that the Scottish Government consider the issue of outsourcing in light of EU procurement laws. A bold statement from Mr Stewart. Oh, he's not jumping to his feet here again. No, he's not. Oh, he is, Mr Stewart. Please. Kevin Stewart. Uh, and if he reads to the end of that paragraph, to ensure that private companies are not allowed to undertake the work. Ken McIntosh. Well, hardly. The, the point is a caveated statement versus, versus the Minister's own actions. The Minister has now removed the whole measure from the bill. And uh, uh, can, I, can I just suggest that we have... Order, I was just please. trying to tease Mr Stewart. I was just trying Order, to tease please. Mr Stewart and the former... Mr Doris, please calm down. I was just trying to tease the former members of the committee, including the current member, Mr Stewart, that uh, we were in agreement on this, but Mr Stewart's principles clearly are compromised by the Minister's instructions, who has, has now changed her mind, and I think the Chamber should all welcome that. Now, uh, the second issue, uh, presenting officer, that I wanted to highlight, and came up a number of times, was that of making cash payments as opposed to uh, providing support in kind. Now, for community grants, uh, that is, for example, helping to furnish uh, a new flat in an emergency, for example, I have no doubt that there were and there are good arguments put forward for providing white goods, furniture packages and so on. The evidence in favour of this approach uh, was much weaker, however, when it came to crisis grants. Many witnesses talked openly about being judged and about being stigmatised by the welfare system. And voluntary sector organisations uh, such as Oxfam and many more, said that if we were serious about wanting to maintain dignity and respect for individuals and families in the system, then at least one way to do this would be to look at uh, allowing clients to exercise choice. Now, this was a theme that was expanded upon by Alec Rowley, Jackie Billy, and a number of others. And, uh, in fact, I noted Willie Rennie's uh, particularly uh, thoughtful contribution talked about the difficulty of grappling with these issues and he said that our fine words need to be reflected in our actions if we actually want to uh, end stigma and build a system based on trust and respect. And I, I thought the argument was put most succinctly of all by the uh, Scottish Campaign on Welfare Reform. In their evidence, they said there's a risk that by systematically allocating goods rather than cash payments, local authorities will remove choice and undermine the dignity of the individual. Handing out vouchers, for instance, can not only limit the choice available to applicants, but can also create stigma, undermine dignity, and lead people to feel that they're receiving handouts rather than exercising a legitimate right to assistance during a crisis. And I would leave the Minister uh, just with the thought that the Scottish Government's own statistics show that in the first year of the interim scheme, more than 80% of the spend was in kind, rather than by way of cash, cheque, or, or bank transfer. Now, the final issue I want to highlight is the decision by the Scottish Government uh, to set a two-day deadline for turning around crisis payments rather than the 24-hour target that was laid down by the DWP. And again, I don't doubt the Minister's good intentions uh, for this process to be as speedy as possible. But when I asked her about this in the committee sessions, uh, she said, and I quote, the DWP's 24-hour deadline for decisions applied only once all the information was there. Sometimes such a decision could take three weeks because the DWP said that it didn't have all the information. I'm simply saying, this is the Minister saying this, I'm simply saying that that is not happening now. Now, according to the Child Poverty Action Group, and I quote, this is not entirely accurate. And I should stress, Presiding Officer, that uh, when the committee spoke to the Child Poverty Action Group, it was after we'd taken evidence and they gave us written information from which I'd like to quote. They pointed out that both the current uh, SWF guidance and the draft regulations both state exactly the same position as the DWP that there should be uh, a two day, that the, the deadline only kicks in after all the information has been gathered. So there's no difference there. They went on to point out that uh, any lengthy delays processing loans, crisis loans, uh, under the old D DWP system were more likely to have related to the need to make a decision about whether the applicant was likely to be able to repay the loan rather than their eligibility uh, for an award. And clearly, ability to repay is not a concern in relation to the Scottish Welfare Fund and should not, therefore, slow down the process of decision-making. And crucially, presiding officer, this uh, CPAC highlighted the crisis loan statistics produced by the Scottish Government, which show that in the last year, 
of the DWP scheme's operation, a decision was made within two days in 98.6% of cases, but in the quarter to June 2014, the SWF achieved only 94% against the same measure. And they concluded there is no implicit reason that processing times should be longer in relation, in relation to crisis grants than they were for crisis loans. They also made another point, this is a point that Alex Johnson made earlier, that they were concerned that the reference, by including a reference to a 48-hour time limit, once all relevant information is received, it may actually lead some decision makers to request evidence when it's not needed. Presiding officer, this is not a minor or unimportant matter. Just in the last week alone, the Feeding Britain report into food banks uh, across the UK highlighted the impact of benefit delays and the number of people left with no income at all in forcing those families to turn to food banks. The Scottish Government's own review of the interim scheme by Heriot Watt University made a number of recommendations on this very point, including the maximum target processing time for crisis grants should be the end of the working day. To conclude, Presiding Officer, the Parliament will have the opportunity to return to the subject of welfare later this week, and I hope we'll have a broader discussion uh, on our whole approach, for example, onto the powers of the Smith Agreement uh, going to be delivered. But I recognise there are, there are differences to explore uh, in that debate. But today, at least, we have a relatively uncontentious bill before us, one where we do all agree in the need, where we do all agree in the broad approach, and where I hope we can focus on a practical and a collaborative manner uh, to get this legislation right. Many thanks. <clears throat> I now call in Margaret Burgess to wind up the debate. Minister, you have until 4.54 p.m. Okay, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'll congratulate Ken McIntosh, uh, who's now uh, going to be shadowing me in this, uh, and he started out, and also to Jackie Bailey on her new uh, post, uh, and I'll miss some of the exchanges we've, we've had here in the Chamber. Um, but I would say to Ken McIntosh, it is a consensual bill, as you said, but he, he then went on, uh, Presiding Officer, to... Um, be controversial in criticising myself and members of the, the SNP members of the committee and actions they've taken, and that's not how I see being consensual. But I am grateful to members for their contributions to this afternoon's debate, and it is encouraging that the benefits, um, that the benefits of statutory Scottish, Scottish welfare funds has been recognised across the chamber. Funds designed to help the most vulnerable in our society to meet short-term financial needs, but also to put them in touch with other services that might help. And a number of members have spoken about destitution, Claire, uh, Claire Adamson and Kevin Stewart in their contributions about just what it was meaning to the individual. This bill gives per permanence to the funds at a time when other forms of support are being eroded, as many members, Bob Doris and others, uh, talked about in their contribution. I will try and address some of the points made. The bill is at a high-level nature, and the bulk of the discussion has actually been on what will take part in regulations and guidance, but I will try uh, and touch on it today. The bill reproduces the wording of the Section 30 order, which provided the Scottish Parliament with powers to legislate for welfare reform. And this means that it gives the funds the broadest possible scope to operate within the reservation. This Parliament can legislate about welfare funds only because of the exception to the Social Security Reservation Order set out in the Section 30 order. So it's not possible to go wider. And I'll add to this in terms of in a lot of... Um, contributions about exceptional families under exceptional uh, pressure. And I would have to say, families under exceptional pressure are not excluded from making applications to the bill. Under the previous social fund, um, it was a criteria, families under exceptional pressure. And there was the guidance which then what described or gave examples of what exceptional pressure is. And the regulations that we're publishing alongside the bill and which we'll be consulting on if the bill is passed clearly and explicitly talks about families under exceptional pressure. And what we're looking at is the way that this is being recorded currently within uh, local authorities because at the moment 44% of the money paid out is for community, for community care grants, is households with children, but not that number are being recorded is under exceptional pressure. And we're working very hard with local authority partners to see that we're getting this definition correct and that we can, we can deal with that. So it is not something that is not being addressed and families under exceptional pressure uh, can apply to the Scottish Welfare Fund. 
There was also, um, I think I'll say a bit more about the, the outsourcing. I think um, Ken McIntosh, if I'm quoting correctly, said, my insistence, uh, my insistence in putting outsourcing out to the private sector. And I think very clearly when I appeared at the committee, the one thing I made very clear, that there was never an intention, never even a thought uh, from me that this would be outsourced to the private sector. And like my colleague uh, Ken, uh, Kevin Stewart, had considered that it may be the third sector it may be an option for third sector to administer the fund for local authorities. But in getting back uh, the information from the Welfare uh, Reform Committee and looking at what that might mean under EU legislation and all the rest of it, it seemed to me the best way to do was absolutely remove that. There was never an intention to outsource to the private sector. I just find that something I would not have ever considered. Um, and like members on the committee, likewise. So the best way to take it out, but there's still the, the power there to allow local authorities to work jointly together to administer the funds if they feel that's best. And I think we have to, to look at a number of speakers. I think Joan McAlpine and others talked about access to the fund. And we want to make this fund as accessible as possible to everybody. There is no intention that, any, that people should be turned away or any gatekeeping. And we'll make that very, very clear in the guidance. There will be no gatekeeping. Anybody who makes an application should be recorded as making an application and should be given uh, the right to have that application reviewed if they're turned down. And we'll make that again clear in the guidance. Local authorities, as um, there has been some, I would say, criticism on the way local authorities are administering the fund. Jackie Bailey spoke in her contribution about... Um, thanking the local authorities who are delivering the fund and the workers there. And I would say at this time, and I said it to the committee, I spent a good part of my time during the recess going round and speaking to the teams on the front line, the local authority teams on the front line. And I can tell you, all of them, um, they found this job something that they hadn't envisaged doing before. They were, hadn't seen that being so close to the, the people they represent, the people in their community. They are bursting a gut to get that money out there to people and absolutely recognise the difficulties that families are facing uh, in their area and are doing all they can to get that out. And the 48-hour the thing, and I'll come back to what... Um, Ken McIntosh said in the 48 hours, the 48 hours is not, you've got 48 hours to deal with this. Very clearly, it's to be dealt with as quickly as possible. And certainly within 24 hours, where possible. And the point I made, and I, if there was any suggestion that I misled the committee, there was no intention ever to do that. I'm well aware that in the Scottish Welfare Fund, it's only when all the information's there that the decision's made. The point I was making, and it was back to the, the, the statements from Quarriers, I think there is a night and day approach between how we deal with it now and how the DWP dealt with it, in that the Welfare Fund officers I'll take it in a moment, if you'll let me finish this point, uh, that the welfare, uh, Scottish Welfare Fund officers in our local authorities um, are being proactive in getting that information so it's not sitting behind waiting and being collected. They've been very proactive in getting that information and that was the point I was making at the committee. I'll take the intervention from... Alex Johnson. Alex Johnson. While I would not suggest for a moment that the Minister misled the committee, uh, it has to be said, however, that while we took witnesses from people who were users of the fund, the clear impression was left with us that some of them believed that their applications had been held till the end of the 48 hours rather than dealt with in a much quicker timescale. Minister. Again, this is something that we will be looking at and dealing with in the regulations very clearly. It's not a matter for the face of the bill, but it's something that we should be looking at in regulations and certainly in guidance as well. But what I don't want to happen is that to put a deadline on that people are working to or they're not getting all the information or gathering the information or in some ways making a quick decision which perhaps is not the, the right decision uh, because they're, they're pushed for time. But it isn't something that I have said that I'll not look at again. What I've said is it's something to look at in regulations and not in the face of this bill. There, there was a number of speakers, Jackie Bailey, Ken McIntosh, Alex Rowley, variety of speakers talked about the underspend in, the, in the, the first year of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And I think what we should be saying here is that in the first year, it was a new fund, it was new to local authorities, it was new to the Scottish Government, and I, I 
make no apology for changing the guidance. I don't think you should have a guidance that's permanent, never to be changed, never to be altered. I think you learn and you change the guidance wh when you see what is happening in practice. And that's what we are doing. But in all of that, we still paid out more money. Our local authorities still paid out more money uh, in the first year of the Scottish Welfare Fund than was paid out in the last year of the Social Fund for grants and loans. So I think we have to look at that. Although we didn't meet the 32 million, that money is not underspent. That money is now getting spent. And the, this current year, that money will be spent by local authorities in this current year in the Scottish Welfare Fund and its ring fence for that purpose and that purpose only. And I would also say, in terms of the, the members that have mentioned, of course the best way to address it is to address the root causes of poverty. And that's what we are doing through our child poverty strategy and also through appointing a poverty advisor uh, to the government to ensure that poverty is considered along every, across every single portfolio of government. But again, um, there will be areas where the operation of the scheme can improve and should improve. And we will work with local authorities to ensure that people who need help don't come up against any unintended, unintended barriers. And there should be no stigma to anyone applying from the scheme. And that, again, is something we'll address in guidance. And the points that have been made about the loans or grants, sorry, grants, um, cash or goods, there's arguments on both sides, but very clearly in terms of crisis grants, the vast majority of crisis grants are paid out in cash. And we're going to be making that very clear again in the guidance as we move forward. But there are sound reasons for some of the, the goods to be, to, to be provided and the evidence from Heriot Watt University and from users of the fund has been very clear. They found that very helpful to them. But of course they should be involved in it. And, and there's no suggestion that people should just be provided with stuff that now that they don't need or it's not suitable to their needs. So we can look ag again at addressing that to make sure that that happens. The variation in the levels of funding paid out in different areas, I don't think it would be appropriate us to put a, a figure on for every single item and say that is how much should be paid out. Local authorities have to have that flexibility, but what is paid out is what the person needs that's made the application. It's not about because you make an application um, for a certain amount uh, goods, that's all you get. So I think we've got to be careful on that and look at it's about what is required. So I'm being told here to, to wind up and I will do. So if the Parliament is content to approve the principles of this bill, I will work with the committee to amend it where necessary to ensure it does what we want it to do and also to listen very carefully to the further evidence that we'll get during the consultation for the regulations and the guidance. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate on stage one of the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion number 11311 in the name of John Swinney on the financial resolution for the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. I call on Margaret Burgess to move the motion in the name of John Swinney. Formally moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 11878. In the name of Fergus Ewing on the Infrastructure Bill UK legislation, I call on Fergus Ewing to speak to and move the motion. Mr Ewing, I'd appreciate if you could go till five o'clock. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I will al always uh, seek to oblige. Um, this uh, LCM relates to provisions in the Infrastructure Bill relating to the Renewable Heat Incentive. Uh, the motion is that the Parliament agrees that the relevant provisions of the Infrastructure Bill 2014-15, which was introduced to the House of Lords on the 5th of June this year, uh, relating to the administration of the Renewable Heat Incentive, so far as these matters fall within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament or alter the functions of Scottish Ministers, should be considered by the UK Parliament. These provisions, Presiding Officer, relate solely to the administration and scheme delivery of the renewable heat incentive. Uh, members uh, will be interested to know that they allow for the appointment of an alternative administrator of the renewable heat incentive, along with the introduction of a new appeal mechanism. They relate to the assignation of payments made under the RHI to a third party nominated by the owner of the renewable heat plant. 
and thirdly, they relate to some elements of existing secondary legislation to be changed using the negative resolution procedure. Administration of the RHI scheme, signing officer, is currently limited to either Ofgem or the Secretary of State at DEC. There is presently no scope to put delivery of the scheme out to competitive tender and appoint a body other than Ofgem as administrator. The amendment is essential for ensuring the long-term cost-effectiveness of the delivery of the RHI scheme and will allow appointment of an alternative administrator. Amendment is also required to enable a new appeals mechanism to be established so that decisions by the scheme administrator, administrator can be appealed. The new appeals process will strengthen the appeals rights for consumers and businesses. Details on the arbitration of appeals will be set out in secondary legislation and the Scottish Government will work with DEC to ensure that any new appeals processes are robust and do not diminish the protections currently afforded to RHI participants. Of particular note is the amendment that allows for all or part of the payments made under RHI to be made to a third party nominated by the heat plant owner. This will make it easier to raise finance to assist with upfront capital costs, helping drive uptake of renewable heat technologies through RHI. Assisting towards meeting the Scottish Government's target to deliver 11% of Scottish non-electrical heat demand from renewable resources and significantly reduce carbon emissions from heating. Uh, presiding officer, we have had the opportunity already on the Energy Enterprise and Tourism Committee to discuss these matters. I was very pleased to canvass in some detail uh, these arguments before members of the committee. And if Mr Johnson wishes to... Alex Johnson. I was going to ask the Minister if you could uh, clarify at this point for my benefit whether the regulations we're discussing here would apply only to renewable heat or whether they could apply to the renewable heat element of a combined heat and power unit. No, they Mr. would only Ewing. apply to... Uh, I believe I can clarify that uh, they would only apply to the renewable heat incentive. Um, in uh, moving this uh, LCM signing officer, I wish to make it clear that uh, we are giving consent to the measures relating to the renewable heat incentive and only to the measures of the renewable heat incentive and not to other matters which are contained within said legislation. We are making this motion because we wish to, to cooperate and be constructive where it is appropriate so to do. And whilst we do so, we cannot accept other parts of the bill relating to underground drilling access rights for oil and gas and geothermal electricity companies, which would allow such companies to drill under people's homes without their permission. It is unacceptable that Scottish people have not been afforded the right in this place to scrutinise and debate this important principle that affects fundamental property rights and we have already made our opposition to the UK Government's plans clear on numerous occasions. We will continue to oppose these measures as the Bill makes its way through the House of Commons. We are supportive of the devolution of onshore oil and gas licensing powers to Scotland and are looking to work jointly with the UK Government to take forward the Smith recommendations in full and as quickly as possible. We will work to ensure that any such developments can only happen under the strictest environmental and planning rules to ensure communities are protected and local voices can be heard. Thank you. My thanks to the Minister and to Mr Johnson. We now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is at motion number 11877. In the name of Margaret Burgess on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 11311. In the name of John Swinney, on the financial resolution for the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is at motion number 11878. In the name of Fergus Ewing, on the Infrastructure Bill UK legislation, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members who are leaving the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.